This is Dan, and I'm being interviewed by Rishikesh Rishi Jha from India, and it's January 31st, 2019, my time, and it was still, it was still January 31st for you, I guess, so go yeah, ahead, ask yeah. whatever you want. Yeah, so hi, Dan. It's, uh, it's a pleasure, you know, to talk with you, and uh, I've been reading Cosmetica for about uh, six years now, mm. and uh, so... Uh, I'll just give a brief introduction of yours, like how you do in your interview. Yeah, you know? go ahead. So, yeah. So, Dan Schneider is an American poet, critic, film critic, essayist, and fictional writer who's best known for his uh, criticism and literary website, Cosmetica. Uh, Schneider discovered poetry as a young adult, and uh, his outspoken critics of academic style writing and political correctness in publishing have caused him to be recognized in a number of media outlets. Now, where do I come in? I'm a fan of his work. I consider myself a second generation fan of Cosmetica. And my favorite quote by him is, I am a human barometer. If you don't like yourself or you're not self-assured, you probably aren't going to like me. Mm. <laughs> okay. So, uh, when you say second, yeah. let me just add, when you say second generation, do you mean that your father or your mother found Cosmetica first? Or? Um, no, I mean, I assumed, uh, I read it somewhere, like second generation oh, okay. as in I'm, yeah, so I'm 30 years old, so I would be, okay. you know. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the website has been on since 2001, right? Yeah, it just uh, turned 18. It's legal. Yeah. <laughs> In the U.S. at yeah. least. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, but it's strange because you don't do any web advertising or anything. So, you know, it's strange that such uh, magnitude of work is... No, like like you so poetically put it, it's it's uh, you know preserved in some corner of the internet. You know. Well, and the thing is, it's actually I think more people from the U.S. over the years and on any given day will read it. But in terms of percentage-wise, for example, you live in India, uh, in Mumbai, and there's probably about fifty to sixty hits a day that I get from Nepal. So there's a mm -hmm. there's a bunch of people in Nepal that love Cosmoetica. There's yeah. there's a certain there's an area, I mean, I don't often do it because I don't, I don't really care where the people are, but there's also some place in near Namibia in, in South Africa where there's a lot of people who read. So I think Cosmoetica is more appreciated outside the U.S. because the U.S. is a dumbed down culture. They don't care about art. They just care about money. And I don't, I don't know if India is any better because uh, as you've, uh, when we were emailing, you would tell, told me how, uh, I've complained about a lot of the MFA types here in India where I, I'll get PhDs who write like five-year-olds. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, in, in many ways, that's where uh, I, I'll talk about this. You know how you said America is a dumb, dumb culture, but, uh, you know, I would argue that that's the case everywhere, you know, yeah. everywhere around the world. I mean, in, in, in many ways, I think America is quite, you know, as hard as it may, you know, uh, it's, uh, I mean, I feel that your country has a lot of, uh, potential. It's always had a lot of potential, but, uh, you know, well, it's it, better than many other countries. I think, I think the U.S. has more potential uh, in terms of the fact that it has more people from different cultures. The problem here in the U.S. is, and I don't know if you have it in India, is what we call political mm -hmm. correctness, is that uh, mm -hmm. when I grew up, I grew up in New York City, uh, and there were mm -hmm. what were called, New York City is on a, an island called Long Island, most of it. And there were what we call white middle class Republican types, which were there was a president called Dwight Eisenhower back in the 50s. People who yeah. have a little bit of yeah. things and are sort of self-satisfied. And what's happened is that instead of, for example, a black person in the U.S. or a Native American mm. or an Indian American or a Peruvian American writing mm. about their culture within the U.S. culture, all they do is put sort of blackface on it, i.e. there's a, a writer named Jhumpa Lahiri, uh, who's an Indian American. Oh, yeah. And when I've read yeah. her, when I've read her books, all her books are, are white people who talk about Indian spices. There's nothing inherently yeah. Indian about it. Yeah, yeah, I understand that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and also, you know, I should say, Dan, I mean, at the sound of being immodest, I'm uh, very, very well versed with American culture, American history. I'm, I'm reading uh, biographies of Teddy Roosevelt, ah. uh, William Howard Taft, and uh, Abe Lincoln, and all those guys. So, you know, mm, okay. all of this is going to come, come and, because I want to ask you everything, right? Because, okay, you know, go ahead. So, yeah, so we'll start with film criticism, all right? Okay. So, uh, uh, the one thing that I will notice is you don't like Steven Spielberg. 
Now, no, no, no. Is there do, any... do, 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 not, do not use a word like like, because I've said this many times. Like and dislike, I don't care what I like or dislike. It's about quality. I dislike some great films. I like yeah. some shit films. Hmm. Hmm. So any of uh, Spielberg's film that you like, uh, like uh, you think it's a great film? Any of his? Uh, nothing that I've ever seen. Probably the best film of his that I can recall seeing what was uh, around 2000, the one with Tom Cruise, where he's, he's got the three people who can predict the future. Oh, yeah. That works. Uh, minority, the, minority. Minority. Report. Report. That works for about yeah. 75, 80% in. And then the last 20% is just a predictable mess and it ruins the whole thing. Yeah. You, you did like uh, Jurassic Park? <laughs> I mean, from uh, a... Um, I mean, I, I love dinosaurs. Most young yeah. American <laughs> boys did. But again, yeah. it was fairly predictable. Uh, Michael Crichton... Uh, a much better film and a much better book was his book in the late sixties about uh, yeah. the uh, virus that gets loose. I forget the name of it. Um, that I yeah, was, yeah, uh, I, uh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I, you know what I mean. I forget the name, but yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, yeah, Michael Crichton. I mean, it was tragedy, right? He died way too young. I think I think he died a few years back. But let me just get back to the point that I stated about like and dislike. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the films of Ingmar Bergman. I have. Yeah. Some of those films are great films, but they don't resonate with me on an emotional level, so I don't particularly like them. A filmmaker from <laughs> Japan named Yasujiro Ozu, for example, his films yeah. resonate with me much more. Uh, some mm. you One of your countrymen, Satyajit Ray, uh, his yeah. films resonate with me the same way that yeah. most of the films of Robert Bresson, a French filmmaker, resonate with me. Um, uh, but there, but I can sit back and say, okay, this Bresson film is not as good as that other Bresson film, even though I like it. Mm. And that's one of the important things that a critic has to do is to be able to look at objectively as possible what works, why it works, why it doesn't work. Because there is no way that I, even if you were in my physical presence, that I can beam my own biases and prejudices into your mind to make you like whether it's a, a vanilla ice cream cone or a film yeah. or a beautiful woman, the way I yeah. would. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. So, uh, okay, and moving on. Now, this is a point I've want, I've been wanting to ask you. Uh, don't you think that the technical elements of a film also matter? Because uh, from the interviews that I've read of you, you know, you often say that. Technically, it's great and all that, but you know the resonance and the emotional and the cerebral aspect is more important. But like, I'll give you an example. Like for me, uh, the production design or the atmosphere or the pacing of the film are equally important. You know, like my favorite film of all time is Ridley Scott's Alien. Mm, yeah. And uh, then there's a uh, uh, David Cronenberg's The Fly. Mm. You know, and to me, what uh, made this film so special was the look, the, the feel that it's happening right next door to you, you know? Well, let's take a so, look. Let's talk about Alien. Alien was Ridley Scott. A yeah. a Alien, Alien and Blade Runner are considered usually his two best films. Alien is a much better film than Blade Runner, though. They're both beautifully yeah. designed. They both have a lot of... Why is Alien a better film? Because even though it has this monster, and even though it's based on a B film from the 1950s yeah. U.S., you know this Ripley character. When when that scared woman goes down and there's the little yeah. cat there, you know what's going to happen, but you've gotten to know her. Pull mm. back and think of Blade Runner. Do we really know much about uh, the Harrison Ford character, the crazy woman, who, the celebrity, the actress, uh, Sean, whatever her name was, who played the, the femme... Whoops. So I was talking about uh, the difference between a Alien versus Blade Runner. Mm. Um, yeah. Uh, now, uh, to me, you know, yeah, Blade Runner is an interesting film to look at. I can admire it, the effects, but there's that famous uh, uh, little speechlet by Rutger Hauer, the the robot at the yeah. end, where he talks about the gates of this and tears lost. Mm -hmm. Well, that's yeah. so trite. It, it's so poorly written, and yet so many people will praise this as some deep moment. Um, uh, think about a pop song or whatnot. Pop songs are based upon triteness. You know, I love her so, cold as ice, mm. this and that. But what makes a yeah. pop song, what carries a pop song, if it's good, is that it has mm. a good beat, it has some complex rhythms, or, or, or whatever it might be. Uh, you can't mm. call something great if it just has one or two uh, great aspects to it, especially if they're mm. technical aspects. Uh, have you ever seen the Brisson film? I mentioned Robert Brisson, oh, Ohisar Balthazar. It's about basically the life and death yeah. of, yeah, of uh, uh, a mule. Yeah. 
The, yeah, the donkey one. Yeah, right? the donkey, yeah, the, the donkey. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, this, this is as simple as you can get, and yet the ending where the donkey seems to be about to die uh, and doesn't actually die when the film ends, but is still living, that there's a, a, a powerful emotion there with that simplicity. Um, now, mm -hmm. that, that's not to say that you can have grand complexions. 2001 is one of the greatest films ever. And it's not yeah. a dull, boring film unless you're a dull, boring person and all you need is yeah. explosions and whatnot. 2001 yeah. blows Blade Runner out of the, the water in terms of uh, being a film. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. But, uh, I mean, uh, uh, with Blade Runner, like, I've read the review, your review of Blade Runner, and... Uh, one thing you say is there are not emotions. There's not much emotions, right? I mean, mm. with, with the Decker character or all the... But I thought it's in the future and they're supposed to be like that, replicant or robotic, just, you know? So oh, do you think that applies? Oh, to, to a certain degree. But... Uh, uh, and I'm not, I'm not big on emotion in film. But uh, the, the, the main problem, I think, with, with that film is there's nothing there to really hook a, re, uh, a, a viewer in to the characters mm -hmm. because you have basically, uh, uh, if Ford's character might himself be a replicant or a robot, he's unemotional. He's sort of like Mike Hammer, which was a 1950s detective uh, set mm -hmm. in the future, 100 years in the future. You've got the robot girl, you've got the Rutger Hauer character, a handful of other characters. Again, compare that to Alien, where you have this crew that in the first 20 or 30 minutes, before we even yeah. see the monster, we get to know how they relate to each other. Yeah, absolutely. The, I mean, great characterization, right? Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I mean, that's why I love Alien. Of course, it's my favorite film, but uh, I also love Big Runner, so, yeah. Mm. Um, and uh, one reference I got from you were the book, Val Newton films, you know, The Course of the Cat People. Yeah. And then I saw one more, uh, The Zombie, the Black Zombie one, you know. Okay, yeah. I, it's been years uh, since I've seen that, that but... Oh, yeah. But, but it really, I mean, uh, that's what I'm saying, like, because especially as a filmmaker myself, you know, and because where I don't have a lot of money, budget, or all those things, so I was thinking, why not, you know, go in that direction, sparse dialogues, uh, more emphasis on the sound or the technical elements, something like that, you know. Yeah, but you, you also, you have to have a, ba I mean, ultimately, when you talk about a story, if you re read any great novel, whatever you consider a, a great novel or a great story, ultimately you're reading for the characters. Moby Dick, for example, if you've ever read that, it's not about a yeah. whale. It's not about a crazy man. It's about many things. You cannot reduce art to a bumper sticker. Art ultimately translates reality, translates the cosmos. When you read about crazy Ahab going down tied to this whale, it's not about the mm. guy dying. It's about human mm. obsession. It's about uh, the American political situation at the time and a dozen other things that come together in a very good way. It's not a perfect book, but it's a great book. And, and greatness is not about perfection. Greatness, yeah. you can have uh, an imperfect film or an imperfect work of art, but still be great. You know, uh, I think if you've ever read, you probably know Roger Ebert, the American film critic. He did a long article about me a decade ago, and um, he talks, he, he, he actually gets the term greatness when he writes about it correct, and that greatness is about stature. A work doesn't have to be perfect. I've written perfect poems that are not great poems, but I've written great poems that have a little bit of imperfection in them. There's a fundamental mm. difference there. Mm. All right. All right. So could you give an example of a film which is, you know, not great, but it's perfect? Like a movie that you can... Um, uh, let's see. Uh, let me think. Um, uh, well... Uh, a good filmmaker to use as an example would be uh, Federico Fellini, the Italian filmmaker. I think mm. if you were to ask me what's the greatest film that I've ever seen, I would say that it was his La Dolce Vita because it works yeah. as a comedy. It works as a drama. It has a musical scene that works. The acting is yeah. superb. Even the worst actress, Britt Eklund, the, the boobalicious blonde, uh, works mm. because her character is supposed to be a dumb, vapid blonde. On the yeah. other hand, he has some other films like... Um, uh, La Strada, which uh, yeah. it has his wife and it has uh, Anthony Quinn in it. And that has moments mm. of greatness here and there. And you could make an argument it's a great film, but it also mm. has some really mawkish, sentimental stuff in it. Um, and yeah. and so it, that's not a perfect film by any stretch of the imagination, but you can make a good argument that it's a perfect film, a, a great mm. film, rather, not a perfect film, a great film. So greatness and mm. perfection are different. I would say 
uh, though La Dolce Vita is as close to being a perfect and a great film as there is, even more so than something like 2001, which does a lot of things that were never done before and still haven't been equaled 50 years on. But I, I can think of no other film where I can't really find a flaw in that. Hmm. Oh, yeah, that's a great uh, opinion. You know, I have one of my own regarding 2001. Go ahead. Uh, there was a, uh, I, I studied script writing in Canada. I went to uh, Ottawa, the uh -huh. capital. And uh, so there was a debate on uh, Citizen Kane versus uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey. And which one do you think among these two is greater? 2001. And, uh, my, 2001, yeah, my yeah, opinion. Yes. Yes, my opinion also, 2001. The reason I said is, although Citizen Kane is fantastic from a technical perspective, and uh, even the whole underlying theme, you know, like yeah. the rosebud and how we all crave for our childhood, but 2001 encompasses something much, much more, right? It encompasses time and space and the entire history of mankind, right? Yeah. So so maybe a film should be judged on those two criteria, like technical elements and the overall him, you know? Well, here's the thing. You can't be so rigid that you get rooted into something. Um, what works, let me, let me give you an example. You've probably seen on my website that I used to run something called the Uptown Poetry Group, where I had a group of poets yeah. that came together. What I tried never to do was in my criticism, I never tried to Schneiderize a poem, meaning I never tried mm -hmm. to write a poem from the way I would write it. I would read a poem uh, and say, okay, this is what I see. Um, Here's how you can make it a better poem objectively. What do you want to do? So then I would say, okay, you do these five things. This will do that. That'll do this. You'll get, it. and I'd explain that. But if the person didn't want that, I, and they they had to say, write about the death of their Aunt Mary. Uh, I'd say, well, then focus this way. As a critic, you also have to be aware that you can't impose your own standards. If I'm, say, a, a liberal-leaning political person, or let's say if mm. I were a religious Christian or something, mm. and mm. I wanted to see a film, and let's say I saw a film about two lesbians, I'm like, oh my God, I, I don't like lesbianism. Well, I can't mm. bring that as a legitimate criticism to the film if it's about yeah. lesbians. You know, yeah. that, that yeah. My, my opinion there doesn't matter. And, and it, it would fundamentally ruin my credibility to say, oh, I don't approve of lesbianism because I'm a fundamentalist Christian and this has lesbians. Therefore, it's a bad film. No, it may mm -hmm. indeed be a bad film because it's politically correct. It may be indeed mm -hmm. a bad film because the acting is terrible or the writing is terrible. But I have to say, it, you know, it's a bad film because of this, not because of what it's trying to do. There's a famous mm. film here in the U.S. called Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer. It's not a particularly, yeah, it's not a particularly good film. It's not a terrible film, but it's not a good film. It's utterly mediocre, and mm. it's mediocre because the acting is is mediocre. There's a few interesting shots. There's a couple of little things about the character that suggest that mm. the it could have been something better and more. But mm. I can't say that it's a terrible film simply because it's glorifying, in a sense, uh, yeah. the serial killer's life. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and I'm going to get back to you on that, the whole moral issue, you know, moral, the question of morality. Uh -huh. um, okay, uh, now, one more thing I want to ask you. Now, you just said you cannot impose your own standards. Mm -hmm. And when I started reading Cosmetica for the first time when I was in Canada, in a school, I remember because I was frustrated because we had a rigid you know, like act one, act two, act three. It has to end in, act one has to end at the end of page 30. Mm -hmm. Act two has to go on till page 90. It was like rigid, you know. Yeah. And, and you must have seen there are so many script writing books, so many books on this, that it's, it's become a business in itself, right? Yeah. So what do you have to say about all this? Like schools are cropping up on, on, on everything, like, you know, poetry and filmmaking, like, and the people who go and teach there, what is your opinion of this industry as a, as a, as a whole? Like it's, it's the same thing that happened in um, ma uh, masses of fine arts writing. At the end of World War II here in the U.S., a bunch of people got together, and they have this political belief, which is a demotic political belief, that everyone is creative. Now, I don't know, do you get, uh, you probably have, I think you, in India, cricket is big, and you probably play soccer. Uh, so I don't yeah. know the names of those people, but you know, in America, at least there's like, you know who LeBron James is, the basketball yeah. player? Oh, yeah. yeah. So uh, think, think of this. Imagine someone said to you, well, if you just practice for a few years, 
you can be as good as LeBron James. Oh, so I'm going to go to the Los Angeles Lakers and say, well, you know, it's just fair that I've practiced for a few years and I should get $30 million a year to play basketball for you just like LeBron James. That's absurd. There are very few people who've ever had, for example, my ability with words. And very few of them have ever worked hard. There are very few people who had Stanley Kubrick's or Orson Welles's or, or, or Akira Kurosawa's ability with uh, the, the moving image. To think that, mm -hmm. that you are owed something or that th just by the, someone telling you that you have a, it's ridiculous. You, you know, I understand the impulse, but it's a bad impulse. You can't, you can't just say by fiat that some, you know, mm -hmm. I, I am not ever going to be a, a baseball player. I, when I was a kid growing up in New York, I wanted to play baseball for a, a baseball team called the New York Yankees, play center field. Yeah. There was a famous guy named Mickey Mantle and Joe DiMaggio before him. Yeah. I wanted to play, I wanted to be a point guard on the New York Knicks like Walt Frazier. Guess what? I wasn't good enough. It would be absurd if someone gave me that job because uh, I just wanted to. But I can do, yeah. I can write sonnets. LeBron James can't write, write a great sonnet. Let him try. Yeah. You know, you have to yeah. know what you're good at. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and that's what these industries are doing. They're like just taking the money, and people are coming in. And know, and they're fleecing it. I know a girl. I know a girl who is on my uh, website's e list. She paid sixty or seventy thousand American dollars to some online university when she knew that she. Uh, this is one of the frustrations. Is I've always opened to talk to people like you, and I've never met you before. Uh, just seeing yeah. you here on Skype. Uh, as long as as long as you're not going to be some asshole and, and go around and harass me or something, I'll talk to anyone and try to enlighten. I don't charge anything. You would ask me what I would charge. I don't. Why am I going to charge? I'm not going to make any money doing this. But I want you as a person, simply because you're a human being that has a mind and has reached out, to be as good as you can be. And that's just my own belief system as how people should act. I don't want. I don't. I don't want anything. I'm not going to make any money. The chances are that I'm probably not going to make any money in my lifetime. I, I work doing physical labor. I, I, I've done many different jobs. Uh, and there are people who have one one hundredth the output qualitatively and quantitatively that I do that have won multiple prizes. Of the, they sit on their asses. They take It takes them seven years to write a piece of crap book. I'll tell you, I, did, I have since in the last year and a half, I'm finishing up my 44th play. And I can tell you, yeah. and, and arrogant as it may sound, but it's true. They're better than yeah. anything Shakespeare wrote. They're better than anything Ibsen wrote. They're better than anything yeah. O'Neill wrote. And why is that? It's because I have read all these people. I know how these things work the way a car mechanic knows how an automobile works. And I can break it down. Someone in yeah. 500 years, for example, who's writing a novel should be better than me. There is something yeah. wrong with our culture if a novelist in 500 years hasn't succeeded me. Now, I can be a vital cog in that chain. You know, when you talk mm. about, you know, that old movie, the Lion King and from Disney, that you know the, the chain of life. Well, this is what uh, Shakespeare is a link that leads to Ibsen, which leads to Williams, which leads to me, which leads to you know someone in uh, Bolivia maybe writing, becoming the next great playwright. Same thing with poetry. Same thing with filmmaking. You go from yeah. the silent masters to Ozu to Akira yeah. Kurosawa to uh, who's the the Polish filmmaker who did the ten films, the Decalogue. Uh, Kieslowski, Kieslowski yeah. to someone else. And, and that's the way it is. You have to learn. And as an artist, I've always said this, steal from the best. Don't plagiarize. Mm -hmm. you, no one's saying you're going to have to redo uh, Citizen Kane mm -hmm. or 2001, but know how they work, know their touchstones. And, and you take those techniques and you make it, you, you take a little bit. From, it's like, it's like cooking. You take a little bit of Kubrick, you take a little bit of Wells, you take, put them together and you are doing a film, say about a, a divorced woman in Calcutta, say, but you're using mm. Kubrick's technique. You're using something from Teo Angelopoulos from Greece. You're using something from, uh, you know, uh, wh whoever it might be, Steve McQueen, or there's a great filmmaker, Nuri Bilga Ceylon from te Turkey. You, you're taking these techniques and you, and if you have that ability and, and, these things somehow become your own as you learn yeah. to use them. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I was, uh, you know, I was obsessed with uh, filming, like, my own version of uh, Stanislaw Solaris. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 And uh, Tarkovsky's, of course, made it. And I, I even like the American version. I mean, everyone hits it, but I think technically, at least, it looks good, like, you know? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, because I wanted to make my own film, you know, and I had a lot of ideas. Like, I mean, even something as, uh, uh, like, the films made before 
the novels written before 1923, for example, they are in the public domain, you know. Or yeah. what if I just make Nosferatu, mm-hmm. you know, and like an Indian version of Nosferatu. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, it can be done, right? It's my personal uh, interpretation of the story with the, with the, you know, different like landscape and all those things, right? Yeah, sure. And, and if you if you said it, say, in uh, Bhutan, and you said it at, yeah. at some kind of... Uh, supposed worship place and if there's some little angle of that i mean these these are such broad ideas nosferatu was was, was accused of plagiarism by bram stoker's estate dracula oh, yeah. you know so i mean in and of itself it's not an original idea before dracula do you know that that there's a million page novel called varney the vampire from the 19th century you can find it on project gutenberg it's a million words it's a terrible book but it, it 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 was one of the biggest selling horror novels of the twentieth uh, the nineteenth century because it was it was written in magazine serials so it was written serially about two or three thousand words at a time there was something like I don't know five hundred installments of it over the course of a decade so if you it, mm. you know all of this stuff is you know vampires which I think people need to leave vampires and zombies alone. There's too much of that crap going on, much, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I just get sick and tired of the infantilization of culture. It's like I'm sick and tired of just seeing nothing but things directed at teenagers and 20-year-olds. To me, yeah. as 50, I'm going to be 54 this Saturday, people in their yeah. 50s and 60s are much more interesting. People who have lived so much, even someone who's a dumb ass, I'd rather talk to someone who's a dummy at 75 because it's much more interesting to say, how can someone live 75 years and be a dumb ass than to say, oh, this guy's 22 and he's a dumb ass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I mean, uh, but uh, didn't the people when you were in your 20s, didn't they say that? Oh, your, your generation is fucked up. We, we were so much better, right? Doesn't well, it happen every generation? Well, yeah, sure, and that's been going on. Yeah, a- a- every generation does, but there are there are there are uh, you know some differences here and there. But yeah, every generation will say, well, they were the new generation is not as you know is is more rude. They don't work yeah. as hard. They don't do this, and yeah. uh, a lot of that is bullshit. Um, but I mean, every so often there are some minor cultural things that are correct about it. I mean, if you look yeah. at if you look at uh, say I'm I'm considered a generation exa just by about a month uh, yeah. uh so when when the baby boomers here in the u.s which were born from 45 to 64 uh, uh, yeah uh, i was so i but anyway our generation was called lazy and this and that and, and whatnot um well anyway, i forgot my point but go ahead <laughs> go ahead no i mean you are absolutely spot on when you began the interview you said we dumbing down the culture you know i mean i can write pages on this i, I spent two years in canada and what i saw it was like how everybody uses like every kid you know in college uses the word like like 10 yeah. times between you know yeah. i was like going there he was like doing this he was like 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 yeah. so i don't know i mean it's, it's so strange and you look at the movies i mean hollywood movies say what you will they're just crap nowadays right just superhero films and uh you know i, I cannot relate to them see that's why i'm saying like uh, in films in the 80s or 70s, you know, like The Terminator or, or Alien or any of those films, at least they looked and they, they felt real. You get the point, right? Well, well, have you ever watched any of the films of John Cassavetes? Uh, no, but okay. yeah, no, I haven't. If, if, if you get a chance, look up John Cassavetes as an American filmmaker. Most of his films are people that are talking that it's dialogue heavy a film called faces was his first great film in 1968 it was a black and white film made independently cassavetes was an american actor who funded his own filmmaking through taking roles like in rosemary's baby it's his probably most famous Mm -hmm. film that he was in um his films are adult films not in the pornographic sense but in the sense that it deals with people dealing with real problems like divorce like self-esteem like uh uh, how do we get along fundamentally? Ultimately, whether we're writing a science fiction novel, whether uh, we're writing about uh, or, or filming a film about this, that, or the other topic, we want to be able to connect to someone because, as I said, art translates the cosmos. So to, how, how, how would, for example, let's say if I wanted to do a science fiction film about a race of aliens that are inhuman, uh, think of yeah. that James Cameron film with the blue cat people, but yeah. make it real with real actors and make it uh, about something more than just an adventure or a love story. 
how yeah. how do I relate to these characters? Well, do those characters have families? Do those characters feel envy? Do they feel mm. greed? Do they have foibles? Are there things that can connect to me that I can learn about, even though uh, you know, the suspension of disbelief that I'm there with them on that alien planet, learning about mm. what makes them? Do they have some religious beliefs? Do they walk on fire? Maybe, maybe, maybe. You know, I did a science fiction novel that's uh, over half a million words long uh, called the, the uh, well, I forget the name of it now, but um, uh, The Edge of the Shown is, is what it's called. And it's it, mm -hmm. it has a number of things, but it, it takes an idea from a guy named Fred Hoyle. Fred Hoyle was a scientist that came up with the idea of the Big Bang. And he wrote mm -hmm. a famous science fiction novel called The Black Cloud, which is what if there was an intelligent being that was just mm -hmm. this giant black cloud floating in outer space and it, mm. it, it was sort of like a disembodied brain with, with, with neurons. That's something alien. If you look at Star mm. Trek or Star Wars, aliens are always these humanoid-looking creatures. The chances yeah. of us finding Klingons or, or <laughs> Wookiees yeah. is next to impossible, uh, at yeah. least in it. Just, just mathematically. They are going to be truly alien. Let's say we found some intelligence, like you mentioned Solaris, an intelligent ocean. That's something, oh, yeah. that's something far more, I think, plausible than Klingons. And let's say we get to this, uh, let's say we get to a planet, and let's say this, this ocean being, single being, or maybe it's multiple beings, com communicates us through just emotions. And, and as we get close to it, well, how do you convey that in a story? How do you convey that in a film? How do you, uh, what is the emotional arc? What is the, the rational arc for this being? Um, these are the things that we would want to know and be satisfied with. If we if we get to the end of a film uh, yeah. like uh, a Solaris, and at the end all we're left with is oh, it was an ocean that was alive. You're going to be disappointed. The ending of the Tarkovsky oh. film, I think, was uh, very good because it ends up back on this person. Uh, I forget the guy's name, who's who's basically reliving his life, and he's back in his youthful yeah. home. What his the facsimile of the youthful home, and all of us have that desire to go home. So there's that emotional arc that Tarkovsky brings, but it's not it's not it's not some uh, trite Hollywood ending. Yeah, yeah. I mean, have you seen uh, the Soderbergh film? Yeah, yeah, and I, I, I thought, I thought it was a good, solid film. I, I don't think it's, it's yeah. nearly as good as the Tarkovsky film, but it's one of the oh, better yeah. films that I've seen Clooney in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, the reason many people criticized is because they, he made it too much about the emotions, the love, and all those things, you know, instead of what you say. I mean, just if you, if you observe the ocean and study the ocean, right. the, astronom the astronomical aspects of it. You know? Yeah, I, well, there's, there's the Hollywood tendency to always want to throw in a love story, and yes, the, the both the, the and I've read the book by Stanislav Lem, yeah. uh, and I've read uh, which is a, a, a really good book. Uh, and yeah. he, he's he did another. There's there's actually a Russian film called um, uh, oh it, it it was made by Roger Corman, butchered into a bad film called the uh, um, uh, the planet uh, planet of prehistoric women. Before that, the voyage to the prehistoric planet, and it was called. Uh, it was it was called something else. The, the original uh, Russian film was a, a good one. Um, uh, Lem Lem had these good ideas, and uh, uh, you know the Holly Hollywood tends to take uh, a perfect example. I mentioned Minority Report, and who, who, who's the mm. right who's the writer that wrote that? Um, book, um, Bill K. Dick, right? Yeah, Dick. Dick is a great yeah. example of someone who yeah. is an idea guy. If you ever have yeah. read Dick's short stories, they're terrible. There's no characterization. Mm. Everything is is trite. Everything. But he has these seeds of kernels. This is why almost every adaptation of a Philip K. Dick story yeah. is better than the actual source material because he had no ability to expand beyond. He, he would come up with, oh, uh, let's say that a soldier goes back in time and finds a yeah. box. And this, Well, the actual story that uh, a Terminator or, or whatever it was was based on, maybe that was Hall and Ellison. Ellison is very much like Dick. Uh, both of them yeah. are idea guys. These guys have these ideas, but there's no way that they can push it. They don't have, they don't understand. I don't think Dick or Ellison basically understands human emotion. So they, hmm. they come up with these ideas and it's up to someone else to bring out or, or make the, the connection at a deeper level. Yeah. I mean, uh, do androids dream of yeah. electric sheep is such a horrible, horrible book. I, I couldn't even, you know, finish 10 pages. Yeah. Right. 
<laughs> and uh, but yeah, I wonder what works for Solaris and what doesn't work for that that book because Solaris, as I just said, Lem is a good writer and he expresses it also very well. You know. Well, uh, uh, as, as I as I recall, and again, it's been years since I've read it. Um, hmm. uh, I'll give you another example. Um, uh, there's the book by Pierre Boulle called uh, uh, Planet des Singes in French, or, or Planet of Monkeys, or, which became the Planet of the Apes film with Charlton Heston. And that original oh. film, for example, or the original book, rather, is a, is a great book. It's got a great twist ending, uh, every bit as good as the Statue of Liberty ending in the Heston film. Um, hmm. But it, it, it it's a film that, uh, or it's a book, rather, that uh, uh, is set in, in a futuristic ape world, um, mm. And it it works because we get to know how the character that's played by Hessen in the film comes mm. to know this society. He eventually learns their language. It's not it's not the Earth as in the film. It's a different planet. Yeah. And there's a really great twist ending uh, at the end of that book. But it's about how does someone assimilate into a culture? How does someone from mm. a different time, a different species, a different planet? assimilate into the, and he ends up basically in a zoo and then then he he, he uh, supposedly i think the char- the main character in the book escapes or something or that and he leaves he leaves his diary he leaves his diary in the rocket ship that he escapes in the real mm. twist ending though is that mm. his diary is found by a couple of astronauts and it turns out that those astronauts are apes who can't believe <laughs> that the hero could be a human being now yeah. it, it it, it, it's something that relies on a gimmick at the end, but the book itself yeah. is not a gimmick. The book is a very insightful look into how does someone uh, from outside fit in. And it's a much better book than, say, Robert Heinlein's Stranger in a Strange Land, if you've ever read that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll definitely have to look this one up. You know, it's mm-hmm. fascinating. But, but so you may just say this is the uh, original source of the Planet of the Apes, right? Yes, Pierre Boulle. He also wrote Bridge on the River Kwai, which is a totally different book about World War II and the blowing up of a of a uh, bridge in Japan. Yeah, yeah, uh, I know, uh, I know that. Japanese held territory, rather. Have you have you seen this book called Forbidden Planet? It's, a, it's an animated yeah, film. yeah. I, I I've reviewed it too. Yeah, that that's one of the that's one of the best sci fi films of the fifties. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, my my favorite genre is sci fi horror. You know, mm. so. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I tend not to go into drama and all that. I don't know. I just don't like human beings as much. So, well, and and you know? the thing the thing that makes that a good film, um, there is there are moments of humor. For example, there's the time when the drunken cook goes up to the robot and says, you know, uh, hey, you know, can you make uh, alcohol? And he goes, you know, something like, will a hundred gallons be sufficient? And the guy who's an, yeah. obviously an alcoholic is like, yeah. sure. And so you have those little moments. I mean, there are great things like the scenes of walking through these huge corridors of this, ma- this machine planet. There's the interesting thing about the Krell being... The Krell are non-human things, and they put it on, and it it, it expands the mind of the the Doctor Morbius, and uh, and what there's a lot of great stuff there. But what makes the film connect on an emotional level is that the characters are believable. We like the Leslie Nielsen character, the Arlene Francis character is a goddess, uh, and yeah. and Walter Pigeon, who plays Morbius, is a credible villain because he doesn't realize he's a villain. He thinks he, yeah. and you know, it, there's an old saying that's actually true: is that the best villains think that they're heroes. Doctor Morbius thinks he's a hero. Mm. Yeah, that's an incredible insight. You know? I'll just take it down. Um, so okay, um, one second. Okay. <clears throat> No, and see, on this note, I also wanted to ask you, or, or give you my opinion, maybe you'll disagree with it. But the reason these films are so special is also because, and I'm talking purely from a technical aspect, uh, don't you feel that uh, shooting on a film camera, 35 millimeter, 16 millimeter, it makes a difference? Now, right now, it's all digital. Right mm-hmm. now, it's all color correction. You sit in a computer, you, you tap the buttons and the color changes. Mm-hmm. And don't you think this has uh, impacted the, the film uh, industry severely because see everybody's jumped on the digital bandwagon. We are all digital now. They're, all the films, you know, stocks are gone. Uh, they're shutting down, and probably in the new future, only like big, big. Uh, at least it's already happening here in Bollywood in India that only the big, uh, you know, studios with money make film films on film cameras. But do you feel that has 
at least to you, like, does it make a difference, short on film or digital? Can you make it out? Can you make the difference? No, I can't because I'm not. I'm not someone who's technically. Uh, you know, I don't know that if it's, I've never handled film, I couldn't tell you anything about the technical cutting of things uh, versus, you know, how that was done in the 60s versus now. That would be the equivalent of me trying to argue that, for example, writing is better or worse now by using a, a word or some uh, computer program rather than an old typewriter. Certainly uh, using, I, I can do things like repetition more easily. For example, if I'm writing a play or a novel and I want to have a character remember something that happened 500 pages ago, I can go back and copy and paste and put it in there and tweak it. It's easier than rewriting and rewriting. So certainly when I said like I, I've written like a two and a half million word novel, there's a, a, a mm -hmm. large part of that is, is repetition and use of, of uh, some public domain material where I have characters, for example, doing different things. Giving you an example, I mentioned my science fiction novel. Uh, that yeah. half a million word novel, I actually took a public domain story that uh, Philip K. Dick had written. It was a terrible story. Mm -hmm. What I did was I took the essence of it, rewrote mm -hmm. it, and then at the mm -hmm. end of the, the novel, I compared side by side what mm -hmm. I had written versus what was what Dick had written to show mine was better mm -hmm. and to show that mm -hmm. a computer in the future did not recognize mm -hmm. that the a character who's saying this story was his own was really plagiarizing mm -hmm. Dick. And so it's a mm -hmm. meta way of critiquing the badness of science fiction writing uh, and, mm -hmm. and, and Dick's writing in itself. But I could not have done that really uh, in the old, it would have taken so long. It would have been so time consuming. So is yeah. I have the ability because I can copy and paste things that other people don't do. I have the ability because I can go to Project Gutenberg and copy and paste, yes. say, three paragraphs from an 1870s uh, anarchist tract that I can have yes. a character quote from that would take me weeks to look up in an old-fashioned library. So, mm -hmm. yes, my my ability to gather information is different, mm -hmm. but it also, it also means I can fail more easily, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I mean, the reason I say is because... Uh, I, I love one of this quote from you, you know, and uh, it says over here, I, I took it down, uh, that today the films are catered towards kids who are, it, it, there's no difference between video games, VR, and, and, and the movies, you know, mm -hmm. and I think in the future, hopefully, we'll get adult dramas aimed at 30 plus or 50 plus crowd, uh, senior citizens, yeah. and it's a gold mine waiting to happen, which is absolutely spot on, you know. But that's my point, don't you think that today's films look too glossy, they look like a video game, like too... You know? I think video games certainly have influenced it. Um, uh, it, it again, though, I, there's going to be someone who will take that gloss that you talk about and can do it well. It's it's the fact that the video game gloss is not used well. It's not used in a purposeful mm -hmm. fashion. I just mentioned how I took, literally, I copied mm -hmm. and pasted a seven or 8,000 word short story of Philip K. Dick into mm -hmm. my novel. And it wasn't because mm -hmm. I was... I, I, what I was trying to do was show that here is bad writing, but it can be mm -hmm. used for a, a greater purpose to show the limits of that bad writing. There is someone mm -hmm. who's smart enough that can take that gloss, that superficiality of the video game glow and do something mm -hmm. great with it. I don't have that ability. Mm -hmm. I'm not a filmmaker. Maybe you have it. Maybe someone that you know has that ability. Mm -hmm. But uh, just because something has a flaw it doesn't mean that that flaw is imminent to it doesn't mean that for example uh I, I mentioned how there are great films i don't like there's a film called persona by ingmar bergman uh yeah. that is a perfect example Ber uh, persona is about this this woman who, who's having uh, or two women who may be some people think it's one i don't but uh, mm -hmm. who, who are sort of twin together and having personal issues a nurse and her patient and mm -hmm. it's it's so, in a sense, pretentious that I get turned mm. off intellectually. On the other hand, Ingmar Bergman does it so superbly. It's such a great yeah. film. Ingmar Bergman mm. is literally, he unzips, pulls out his penis and says, here, I'm Ingmar Bergman. You top this motherfucker. And he's Ingmar yeah. Bergman. He can get away with that because he is so proficient. He is so great a filmmaker at that point in the late 60s. He could just, you know, he could just, have 30 minutes of, of him masturbating and he'd do something yeah. great with it. He was working at such a high level there. And that's, yeah. and that's one of the things that uh, when you have someone 
who can do something and make it so new and so so vile. He can take what would otherwise be just pretension, and it's a pretentious film, but it's a great pretentious film. And that's the difference. The greatness easily overrides the pretension. Uh, because of the pretension, I don't like it, but I'd be an idiot to say it's not a great film. Yeah, yeah. All right. So I'll, I'll ask you one last question on film, then okay. we move on to other things, you know? Okay. So this is a question that uh, I have, which I call the psychology of understanding, you know? So the psychology of when and at what stage of life did you see that particular film? So for example, you say Godzilla's Revenge is one of your favorite films, right? Yeah. But you saw it you, you saw it as a kid. Have yeah. you seen it as a mature, cynical person? Maybe you, it wouldn't even register. Do you agree? Um, because you saw it as a kid at that point of time in your life, that's why you think it's good? No, no. I mean, I as a kid, I liked the film. I, I appreciated mm -hmm. its qualities on an intellectual mm -hmm. level as I got older. And I could see I could see that I can understand why a lot of people think, well, it, it like I said, it reuses old other Godzilla films that are bad films. But hmm. but it does it in a way. Uh, it, it has a kid who's a latchkey kid. It has a kid hmm. who may or may not be in the in the the orbit of a possible sexual predator. This old man hmm. who seems a little too eager. Uh, now yeah. it, he deals with bullies who, who who taunt him. He deals with a couple of gangsters in in a comical uh, scene that that again uh, ma makes the film work more because it has a sense of humor about itself. He sees Godzilla's son, who's this bizarre character, uh, and yet he has this real friendship, it seems, with the character. Um, and all of these things are probably just going on in the kid's mind, uh, hmm. most of them at least. Uh, and it's because yeah. he's lonely. There's a couple of scenes where his mother seems more concerned about going to work than being with him. We hmm. see at the end, we only see, I think, his father at the end after he's done a naughty thing and kicked over. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. The paint of a guy painting a sign, uh, and his mm -hmm. father's his father's on on a railway train, uh, or whatnot. So we get the idea that this is a, a lonely kid. Intellectually, as a six year old, even though I was smart, I couldn't get all of that. Just like I couldn't get right. all of the thing about Curse of the Cat people, about the little girl and the fact that her mother yeah. is dead and she's imagining her. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, there there may have been that I, emotionally uh, I connected with it and maybe understood some of it on a way I couldn't uh, elaborate, but uh, mm. I, you know, I, there are certainly films that uh, I can look back on, you know, for example, uh, here in the U S there's a television show called the Brady bunch when I was growing up yeah. that I liked as yeah. a kid, but looking back mm. on it, it's not well acted. It's, it's a, oh, yeah. it's, it's a classic because it's cheesy and so bad, but it's mm. not, it doesn't have the emotional resonance, say, of Godzilla's revenge to me, and I don't think it works mm. technically as well. Um, there are other right. television shows I grew up with that I can look back with and, and say, yeah. you know, the 1970s in America was the golden age of television. Um, oh, yeah. But I can only Gosh. look... Yes. Well, MASH, Mary Tyler Moore show, Bob Newhart show, uh, yeah. there was Carol Burnett, there was The Odd Couple. There were so many shows that were intelligently written uh, and didn't condescend to you. And this is one of the things that bad art does. It condescends to you. It says, you're a fucking idiot. So I'm going to tell you this. This film is about nuclear war being bad. This film is about, mm -hmm. you know, gay bashing being bad. This film is yeah. about uh, lynching people who are black or from Africa yeah. is being bad. Yeah. Well, uh, unless you're a total psychopath, you know that. You don't need a work of art to do that. Put it on a bumper sticker. Show me something yeah. that tells me that you respect me intellectually, that you don't have to spoon feed me. I, you know, I'm 54 years old. I haven't been spoon fed for over half a century. Don't spoon feed yeah. me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the reason I said this is because, uh, and the same example I used in Citizen Kane is, is because when he says Rosebud, and then there are so many articles, so many pieces that are saying, what does that mean? What does that flag mean? And I could, the first time I saw it, I could just understand. It means it's his childhood, his, his happy days. And then that's what, regardless of your nationality, skin color, or religion, everybody would relate to that. And, and, yeah. let's, and, and the film would not work any less if we hadn't seen mm -hmm. that last shot of the sled. If we didn't know what Rosebud was, th th there's this mm -hmm. idea that people want everything explained to you. Life isn't mm -hmm. like that. I could, you know, I could psychoanalyze you for 20 years and maybe, mm. I don't know, maybe you have a phobia against left-handedness or something. Where did that come? Well, we may never know. It may just be one. Yeah. In, the, in life, in reality, in the universe, there are these things yeah. called just because reasons. Why, for example, is gravity the way it is? 
Well, it may just be that that's just the way it is. If gravity were a little different, you and I might have tentacles. <laughs> Uh, yeah. yeah, that's a very well, very great way of putting it, you know. Uh, again, you know, last point on that note, you know, because I read the article, Dan Schneider was the rest of the world, if mm. you remember from the yeah. city pages. And uh, when, when the article opens, uh, it says that you're watching a wrestling match or something, and you say it's not the same as when I was a kid, you know? Yeah. So, and, and I mean, that's the sentiment that everybody has, I feel. Like, even I, when I watched wrestling, Bret Hart and Undertaker, early 90s, you know? Yeah. So I don't think today's wrestlers match up to that. You know, so maybe it's a, it, it could be that childhood thing. I could be wrong, but who knows? Well, it's that, it's that way. If you look back, for example, at the first girl you ever thought was pretty, assuming that you're straight, oh, yeah. uh, you know, you might look at her today and uh, an old photo and say, boy, there were a lot prettier girls. Why did I like her? You know? Yeah. I know, I know. Yeah. And you only realize later on. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So thanks for the film thing. So you have time, right? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. Continue. All right. So, um, yeah, so again, now I'll go on to be more abstract things, you know, like okay. as, a, as a mentor, I'll just ask you, you know. So, uh, you say the meaning of life, there's not the secret of life, is there's no secret, there is no meaning. Right? Probably. I, I, I can't say, I can't say that definitively. I'm not an immortal being, I'm not infinite, but I, I would, you know, suppose there's this idea that the, the universe is a hologram, a computer program. So, yeah, imagine, imagine that it is, and there's some kid who concocted this universe as a science project in whatever society it's in. Well, does that fundamentally yeah. change that I have to pay taxes? Does that fundamentally change that I'm going to die? I mean, at one point, you know, the, the whole uh, uh, elephant standing on elephant, standing on turtles, standing on turtles, you know, at somewhere, yeah. ha since there is something and there's not nothing, and I don't think, uh, I don't think any human being that I know can even conceive of what nothing could possibly be. Because yeah. nothing isn't blackness, nothing isn't silence. That's blackness and yeah. silence. What is nothing? Yeah. Since there is something, that means fundamentally there has to be a base reality. It may be so far removed from us that it's infinity minus one removed from us, but there is a base reality somewhere out there. So even if I'm a computer program of a computer program of a computer program mm -hmm. all the way down, or I'm mm -hmm. the dream of a god, I'm the dream of Vishnu, who's the dream of... Bumbaba, who's the dream of Ukma, you know, whatever gods all the way down. Yeah, yeah. There's something fundamental. There is one, there is a base reality. So since there is, let's talk about it. Let's experience it. I, mm. I you know, whether there's an infinite number of universes, whether there's just mm. this one, I don't know. But mm. I can't really think that there, there could be a meaning. I don't believe there's a single God. If I, if I, if I were religious, I would think that polytheism is a little bit saner. I, I don't think that there are gods or, or ghosts or, yeah. or yeah. wicked creatures from the imagination yeah. wandering around, but, but you know, anyway. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I see, and this is one of my personal beliefs that I spout every time, you know, if I'm in discussion with anyone. Uh, and I believe that the reason, answer to our reason to exist or purpose will come from outer space, you know? It has to, right? See, people try religion, people try all kinds of things, but maybe from outer space. You say, you say nothing will change. You say that uh, I still have to pay my taxes. I still have to do this and that. But imagine if today they say that they found microbial you know, life form in, in our solar system. That would change everything, won't it? I mean, that would change. To, to, to some people, but the people who are obsessed with Kim Kardashian, who gives a shit? They don't care. And this is the thing I tell my wife. My wife, I, my wife is more of a typical artist than me. She has all of these emotional ups and downs. You know, she wants to be known. She wants to be read. She wants people to, and so do I. But I, 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 I tell her, you know, uh, this is, you know, th th this is temporal. Uh, you know, fifty, a hundred years from now, everyone we know is going to be dead, and ultimately, our work will be out there. I might not ever get rich off of it, but it will be out there. There, there are tens of thousands of people at minimum that have read my work. I, I mm. deal with people like you have who, who, who pop up. Um, it would, it would be nice to be able to, to be able to not have to work and, and deal with the stuff. You know, I, I work. I told you a blue collar job. Just yesterday, I had yeah. to call in my company number because there's a a co-worker that's been harassing me and other people at work. So why do I have mm. to deal with this? Is there any great fundamental thing? No, yeah. life just is. Uh, uh, I, 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 don't, I don't feel particularly put upon. Yeah, there's things I have to deal with. Uh, 
I've had in the past medical issues. You know, why did this happen to me? Uh, why did this girl not like me? Uh, why did I, you know, a few years ago, you might have read, I, I wrote about losing this job because the company I was working for was breaking the law and I followed the company process and they fired me because they were breaking the law. And in the state I live in, in the U.S., it's legal to fire someone for doing the right thing. Why is that? I can't answer that. People, people do what they do. I can only, I can only account for me mm. and how I deal with life. Yeah, but again, you know, like then the whole, uh, then why not be a hedonist, you know, and then why not be, you know, like those things come into play, right? And well, because, because just on a, uh, for me, on, on a functionary level, if I was a hedonist, I would be wasting a lot of time. I only, you know, I might only live to be 80 or 90. I could die next Tuesday. Uh, I want to get as much of things out here because I want people to know about mm. the world that I knew. 5,000 mm. years from now, 10,000 years from now, if there's yeah. an alien species out there and they've got a ga galactic encyclopedia and someone mm. is thumbing through or, or tentacling through and, and they go, oh, Earth, it's in this mm. quadrant. And oh, ancient Earth artists, literature. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. let me oh, this guy. He, and I that creature or mind or being reads this and says, wow, 10,000 years mm. ago, this person had this thought. I had this thought when I was in the other galaxy. How could this yeah. person have known this? That's like Homer. That's like Rabindranath Tagore, who's the only writer that uh, I really know from India, reaching out a century later and understanding yeah. something. This is how we communicate. This is what I say about, about art translating the cosmos. If I can mm. have an effect that, that mm. makes you understand something a bit more, what mm. that's greater to me than living for a billion years because if I'm a billion years, I'm going to be one decrepit old son of a bitch. You know, I, I'd sooner be immortal by being read. I'm not like Woody Allen who wants to be immortal by living forever. If, yeah. you, if I want to be immortal, read me, read me yeah. because Dan Schneider, the person that you are talking to, I'm just a collection mm. of atoms, but the works, yeah. the, the, the people that I write about, the things that can mm. touch you either emotionally, intellectually, that's what matters. And touching you intellectually, by the way, is much more important than touching you emotionally. Because if I touch mm. you intellectually, what will happen is you will go and think about it again. And sooner or later, mm. that will seep down into your emotion. If I merely mm. touch you emotionally, there's no guarantee mm. it's going to seep upward. This is why we have things mm. called tearjerker films. No one mm. really looks at a tearjerker film and, and goes, boy, you know, there was really some great idea there. No, they're just going for the, the yeah. cheap emotion. But if you yeah. if you watch 2001, to do, just to give an example, the very first mm -hmm. time when I was about 10 or 11 and saw this movie on late night television, I saw yeah. when Hal the computer was being unplugged in that red room. Yeah. I cried yeah. for Hal. I cried yeah. for Hal. Yeah. I felt emotion yeah. for Hal, who was a killer. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, just like uh, you cheer for the Nazis in a spiritual life, right? Uh, everyone's going to call you crazy, but it makes sense. If you yeah, but it, right? but when when you have a, a, a an idiot like Roberto Benini, you know, you you yeah. want him to die, you know? Yeah, but yeah, see, and there's so many things like that's why I uh, quoted your meaning of life. It, it's a quote I saw on a website, Dan Schneider, and you wrote that. And, and it's pretty much nihilist, in, in, like there's no purpose or there's no meaning or there's nothing, right? So that's what kind of depresses me in a way. I mean, I, I, I admire but, your but, but you make you make meaning. You you Rishi, you are that 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 is not not that is that is empowering. You have the power to make your life meaningful or not. I have said I'm going to to write more stuff. I'm going to write greatly, and I'm going to affect people long after I'm gone. That's more empowering than me being a billionaire like Donald Trump and deciding I'm going to fuck up the world or I'm just going to make money. Who gives a shit about Bill Gates? Who gives a shit about Jeff Bezos from Amazon? All of these, these yeah. people who are these nihilists who don't give a shit about people. You know, yeah. I, you can only have so much money. But, know, but yeah. and, and, and I've said this and, and I want you to think about it. I'm going to give, I'm going to give you three names and, and you tell me if you've ever heard of them. Shakespeare, Picasso, and Beethoven. You've heard of these guys, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, now let me ask you this. Who was the richest man in England who wasn't a royal when Shakespeare was alive? Who was the mayor of Picasso's town when he was alive? And who yeah. was the greatest 
uh, salesman, uh, or, you know, merchant in uh, the province that Beethoven was in. These people are much more important than these guys when they were alive. Mm -hmm. But who gives a fuck yeah. about them now? They did nothing to advance the, the cause of humanity. Beethoven, mm -hmm. Picasso, and Shakespeare, whether you like them or not, yeah. they did. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a great personal perspective, you know, and I thought, I mean, I don't know, I would think that, hey, at least I would want to, like your wife, you know, experience it myself. If I'm dead, then you get the point, right? I yeah. Mean, I'm dead. Yeah, so, I said that, I said that she, my, my wife, will, she'll go, you know, you know, I, I want to know what someone in, you know, 2168 thinks. I said, uh, in 2168, yeah. I'll be dead. It's not mm -hmm. going to matter, but it will matter to yeah. that person, hopefully. Just like, you know, and I said, you know, we, we talk about people like Emily Dickinson or Gerard Manley Hopkins, poets who are not famous in their day. You can talk about uh, uh, Vincent Van Gogh. Uh, I, I recently, mm -hmm. a year or so ago, I watched this cartoon film made about Van Gogh that was okay, mm -hmm. had some positives, but it was mostly negative. Um, mm -hmm. Van Gogh sold one painting in his lifetime. Now, I, I think he's a bit overrated compared to some other painters, but there's no doubt that he did some great work. Would Van Gogh, yeah. would, would, would the world be better off if Van Gogh had been famous? If Van Gogh died knowing that he was famous, would that really have made a difference to anyone other than him? What Van, what Van Gogh is, when people talk about Shakespeare, they're not talking about the dead man under Stratford on Avon. When people talk yeah. about Van Gogh, they're not talking about the Dutchman that killed himself. They are talking mm -hmm. about the art. Dan Schneider, when people read me in 200 years, they're not going to be talking about the guy with who's nearsighted and, and, and worked his ass off and, and, mm -hmm. and whatnot. No, nothing I've done in any job that I've done. Uh, mm. and no matter how hard I work, no matter how much I pride myself in doing a good job in whatever it is, mm. whether it's cleaning toilets or anything, none of that matters more than a few days at the most. But oh, yeah. when, but the, the poems that I've written that I've gotten feedback and people saying, Dan, I read this poem of yours on this website, you know, 12 years ago, and I followed you ever since. That's more mm. important. Even if the person themselves isn't a great poet, it's meant something yeah. to someone and it's enlightened them. And maybe they yeah. will tell their grandkids about this Dan Schneider's poetry. And that grandkid may be the person who starts a printing press uh, or a, a yeah. publishing press and, and pr publishes all my yeah. stuff, whatever. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm sure uh, you, you find it much better that someone from Singapore or India is talking to you, knowing your work than someone paying you $2,000, for example. Right. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, uh, now if it was two billion dollars, that would I, I, I take that because <laughs> yeah. then then I could yeah. fundamentally change the publishing industry. But, you yeah. know, the, you, you probably, when you mentioned Singapore, you, you know, this kid then who uh, in Singapore, who uh, is a fan of my work and has written some things. Yeah. So, I mean, we are, we are in touch. Actually. Oh, so, OK. OK. Yeah, through you. So, oh, okay. Uh, he's, he's more into poetry. I'm more into films, but they connecting oh. God. Okay. You, well, so. see there. I didn't even know that. So and that that's good. And that and yeah. and that's to to be a bridge between people individually is nice. But yeah. hopefully, it, it's it's more than just oh, uh, you guys, you know, want to hang out on a chat together. Hopefully, you'll exchange ideas with him, yeah. <clears throat> and maybe yeah. that makes both of your art better, independent of yeah. that. Yeah. I mean, I can see he has so much talent, right? I and mean, he analyzes your plays, your your. Uh, Enough poetry. I'm not in poetry, so I don't know. I just don't go there. But yeah. I can see the, you know, interest. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, it was great. So I'll ask, I'll move on to the next question, right? Okay. Now, this is a very big uh, thing that I've always wanted to ask. Technology in general and the internet in particular. Now, before I say anything, I have to say, of course, the internet is a boon. I wouldn't know you if the internet didn't exist. Yeah. If you wouldn't know. So we wouldn't Things. But don't you think that on some level it's a double-edged sword? I mean, the attention span of the people, I'm oh. experiencing it like, on a daily basis. Yeah, uh, no, no doubt. I mean, it's like anything else. Television here in the U.S., I don't know about television. Do you have, mm -hmm. is, uh, is television commercial or is it government-sponsored in India? No, no, I mean, you see, it's, it's the same everywhere. Netflix, the Amazon thing, right? Oh, okay, it's, so it's, you're talking about, yeah, I mean... Uh, here in the U.S., television, you know, has spent 70 plus years and most yeah. of it's garbage when it could be something better. Um, the Internet, you know, in, in a sense, I, I'm not a big porno fiend. Uh, that's not to say I've never looked at pornography, but I think it's good that there is porno for free, that someone I, I'd sooner have someone whacking off rather than becoming some serial killer because he can't get laid. But. <clears throat> 
if, if the only thing that the internet is good for is pornography and trolls on web celebrity websites, then it's pretty much a waste. But we mentioned Project Gutenberg. My God, uh, look at all the stuff that's out there. And I'm, I'm a big yeah. advocate of the public domain. I think the U.S. has fucked the, the people over. I mean, imagine, not that I think they're great literary characters, but imagine a film where you could have Batman taking on uh, James Bond, if they were both in public domain 40 mm. years ago, they'd be in public domain right now, both of yeah. those characters. Um, yeah. I, I think I think things like that, things like public domain films uh, are, mm. are great resources. And this is what the internet can do. Having Skype mm. that you and I can connect in that way, having websites is good. Um, but yeah, most of it's going to be dumbed down. Uh, my, mm. my website or my, my YouTube channel, the average... I, I, you might have seen some of the people I've interviewed academics, I've interviewed yeah. philosophers, actors, I've been 25, 26 actor interviews uh, with some mm. very good, intelligent people. People mm. don't want to watch, however, two and a half yeah. hours of an actress talking about yeah. acting technique because they want to watch a girl who's 14 years old talk about putting mascara on. She'll get 25 yeah. million views in two weeks. That actor yeah. who, who spent a decades honing her craft yeah. I'll get mm. 800 views in a year. Yeah, yeah. 2.5, 2,500 views. Yeah, that's yeah. what the usual, uh, I see on YouTube the videos, like 1,000, 2,000. The one on yeah. sex, you know, it has more, like 4,000 views, but that's yeah. because of the picture. That's Lady Lion, <laughs> I guess. Yeah. <laughs> but, but see, my, my uh, uh, question is, like, on a much larger scale and related to my profession, filmmaking also. See, what I noticed, and I'll give you an example. Uh, last year, there was an article that in Variety that Netflix is producing 90 shows uh no not 90 shows like i think around 300 and something shows this year in 2019 mm -hmm. all right and uh, the the average ratio was a new show every four days mm. so my point being that there is just too much content out there for tvs for movies for cinema uh, one more reason why the film camera you know because i don't know if you know this but technically you know when the film camera would shoot they only had like one role yeah that yeah. was it now, now you can just go, you can come back, you can keep doing it and change the you know, thing in the computer later on. Yeah. So there are just, there's just way too much content and that's what, there's, there's the nihilism that comes in. That's what scares me. See, you say that Cosmotica will be discovered. I hope so, you know, mm -hmm. but I feel that there's just way too much content. Movies come, they're forgotten in one week. Right. Well, you remember that? I, I don't like the very term that YouTube uses, content creator. I don't just create content when I'm doing an interview. Forget, forget, forget even if that I was a writer or an artist. Forget even if that I'm a great artist. If, if for example, uh, there's a video I did, for example, which I think is one of the probably 10 or 20 most important videos and, and films ever made. And that's an hour and 40 minutes of showing me writing a great sonnet because I explain the creative process as I'm literally doing it. It's from 1998. It's on my eCosmoetica channel, although you can access it from the... Cosmo Medical Channel, but these these are, are, are things uh, you know content content. You you have to have something more. My belief is, and I could be wrong, is that there's already a, a profession known as cyber archaeology. I don't know if you've ever heard of a cyber archaeologist. These are people who go back to the stuff in the '80s and '90s when the internet was called ARPANET, and they through their who do 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 voodoo can somehow bring up old websites and they can look up at things. And I believe that at some point in 50 or 100 years, assuming that global warming doesn't kill us, which I don't think it's going to, but uh, uh, these there will be people that will go back and say, well, let's look at the turn of the century. And I think, I think slowly but surely, I've always called it the ever opening cone of greatness, meaning that if you look at, like I mentioned, if you look at Van Gogh, if you look at Emily Dickinson, yeah. They weren't published. They, they they weren't entities in their lifetime. But someone finds it, they open up. There's, uh, I forget her name. There was a photographer here in America um, that there was a documentary. I, I The name slips me. She was a great street photographer. She's become worth millions since her death. Other people are like vampires feeding off of her. But nonetheless, her work is now out there. Her name is known, even though I forget it. But... Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, she was, I think, the schizoid woman or something. It's a documentary on her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And but uh, the, photographs and yeah, but the, the the point is, I think it will get out there. Uh, the, the the chaff, the bad stuff, tends to fall away because every generation looks to the previous generations for quality. And mm -hmm. I mentioned that Barney the Vampire million word novel. 
No one is yeah. looking on Project Gutenberg for Varney the Vampire, but they will look for Moby Dick. They will look for something by Jack London. There is a great mm -hmm. poem, Elizabeth Barrett Browning, who's a poet. You may have heard of mm -hmm. Sonnets to the Portuguese. She wrote, yeah. she wrote a novel in verse called Aurora Leaf. It is probably mm -hmm. the best novel in verse, certainly in English language ever written. And it's a feminist mm -hmm. novel, a, the century before feminism. She's a better poet. She's a better writer than Emily Dickinson could ever dream of. But she's she's mm -hmm. marginalized because she was she was married to Robert Browning, a famous English poet, and because she was a woman, and because she wrote these sonnets of the Portuguese, which are excellent sonnets. But she's sort of been ghettoized as a sonneteer. But my point is, <laughs> there, there, I I really do believe there will be people that will be hashing through this. I think that by making connections with someone like you, or mm -hmm. or, or with Xin Zhanzian. Some people will find these things. Maybe someday someone like you or another filmmaker uh, will say, you know, this Dan Schneider was interesting. I want to do a documentary about Cosmoetic or I want to do, you know, uh, about his ideas and, and whatnot, whatever it might be. You know, like I said, I, I'd be foolish to, to, you know, I'm 50, I'm going to be 54 in a couple of days. I'm not, I'm, even if I won, you know, a billion dollars in a lottery system, it's not going to change yeah. my life fundamentally. I could, I could, yeah. I could change other people, and I could change art fundamentally. But it's not going to fundamentally mm -hmm. change me. I'm set. I'm, I'm in my my ways. You know, I'm going yeah. to be who I am, regardless. Mm -hmm. I mean, look, I, I, I appreciate your optimism, and uh, but I think, I mean, I'll have to disagree because I'm not just talking from an art perspective, like from a societal perspective. Also, what I mean to say is like. There's just way too much content, Facebook, YouTube, people don't have the time. That's one thing. Second thing is, like you said, the attention span is gone. You know, the majority of people, I'm not saying like, like, you know, but the majority of people cannot sit through, the, see Netflix, for example. I have seen people change like five minutes, they don't like it, they change it. Five minutes, yeah. they change it. Yeah. You know? Well, so what if, let, let me just say, I, I, think, I think what you're doing is overestimating the past. The past, mm -hmm. guess, guess what? There were idiots in the past. They didn't. They weren't online trolls, but they were the weird people who would sit in a corner and suck their toes and talk to themselves and and you know hear dogs talking to them. They were the idiots that would go around and would just eat and fart at the end of the night. They didn't have the internet, but those idiots were still there. Trolls are not a new phenomenon. Trolls are just using a technology that helps them be recognized as trolls more easily. I've I've, I've said some this, and let me just give you a quote: is that that the internet has exploded the myth that there's the wisdom of the common man. The common man is a boob, an idiot. Mm -hmm. They vote for people like Donald Trump. They vote for people like Hillary Clinton. They don't mm -hmm. want real things. You can, you can, there's, you know, as P.T. Barnum, an American showman said in the 19th century, there's a sucker born every minute. But yeah. there are people who are intelligent. Art has always appealed to the, the upper crust intellectually the elites, the best, the elites in the best sense, not elites because their daddy gave them money, but people who are elite because they are intelligent, because they care about more than just their own little lives. Yeah, yeah but uh, I mean, I'm not looking from that perspective. See, you, you just said the, the example of Van Gogh, but then how many people were painting during Van Gogh's time? That's my question. How many films were being made in the 1950s? See, I, I looked at all this, you know, when the Gutenberg, Russia Gutenberg, I go yeah. and the, uh, you know, there are pages on like 16th century everyday life. You know? yeah. I like to see what people thought, you know. Yeah. So my point being that there was not much content being made. See, so like in the in the 40s, it, you could say that, oh, this film was recognized. But then how many films were made in the 40s in any given year, 1942 or 1957? You're, abso you're, you're absolutely true. But, but like I said, there are people, there is a whole field called cyber archaeology for stuff online. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you, here in America, and I, I showed my wife this and I've showed other people, if you go to used bookstores, you will you will be amazed. You'll go to the shelves and blow the dust off dusty books, and you'll see names of writers and books. And uh, and my wife has said, you know, we, she, we've made fun of some of the bad writing. And, and I said, you know who that was? I said, that was the David Foster Wallace of 1890. And look mm. what's happened to that person because it falls away. No one is going to be reading Thomas Pinchon. No one is going to be reading David Foster Wallace, these dead white males, you know. And I, as much as I rail against political correctness, I at least understand why people want that. They, they want, you know, they want, they want an Indian David Foster Wallace. They want a black or a lesbian Thomas Pinchon. For me, mm. be... 
I, I want I, I want diversity in thought and quality. I you know mm. I don't care that you're Indian. It doesn't matter mm. to me. I, I don't care that you have a penis and testicles. Whether you're a, a female or whether you are intersex, that doesn't matter. Whether you whether you're a homosexual or heterosexual, whether you're a Hindu or a Christian, none of that matters to me. It's it's mm. that you have a mind, and it is all. It, it is no doubt. It's going to be much harder a hundred years from now than it is now. But mm. I, I do think that it, it also becomes a lot easier. They're going to be smarter. We can talk about how dumbed down things are, but I can tell you, just in my lifetime, when I was going to kindergarten, when I was five years old in 1970s, kindergartners mm. are smarter now. They're smarter in the functionary things. Well, I'm not mm. talking about creatively, because creative people are always been a breed apart. But your average mm. kid, your average five and six-year-old today, I've had kids talk to me and email me talking about black holes, talking about mm. concept. You know, now I knew that. I knew what, what a black hole supposedly was. I knew what the Big Bang was when I was five or six. Mm. But I can okay. tell you, most of my friends, they were, they were sticking their fingers up their ass and scratching their asses and picking their nose and loving their boogers. <laughs> that's, that's about mm. it. Not that there aren't booger-loving kids today, but there are more mm. kids now who know about black holes and know about oh. Teddy Roosevelt and know about uh, comparative religion. They'll know here in America, for example, what Islam is. In 1970, mm. your average 50, uh, a five-year-old kid didn't know what Islam was. Mm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but also, you know, like, uh, like you said, that uh, your written interview, it's one of the most read and, and it's, it's one of the most high quality interviews online, you know, mm. and it's true because I haven't read this kind of content anywhere. And likewise, uh, the interviews on the television, and the examples you gave, Dick Cavett, William Buckley, yeah. or the Open End by David Susskind, you know. Mm. So now thanks to the internet, thanks to YouTube, I watch all those things. You know? yeah. And and don't you think that it has severely deteriorated, like the interview format or, or, or you know, you get yeah. the point, right? Like, yeah, I mean, it, th there's no doubt about it. Um, everything is about money. Um, uh, this is why... Uh, just, tangentially here in the, the US, unionism has declined. And people wonder why there's there's this divide between the wealth. People, I worked about 15, 16 years ago with this woman at at and I worked as a collections representative doing collections for bills uh, for at and There was a woman I worked with and she was a nice enough woman, but she was dumb as a post. She literally, this is when I was living in Minnesota. Minnesota is a cold northern state in the U.S. Yeah. She literally said to me one day, well, I can go without paying my heating and, and, and uh, uh, electricity bills, but I can't go without my cable TV. This is the mindset. And this, this woman had three or four kids at the time living with her. This is the mindset of most people. They, they, people are so solipsistic, so selfish. Uh, that they just want this entertain. They just want content. They want to. I, I worked a couple uh, a year or more ago uh, as a custodian uh, at a mm. local school when I got fired from the other job that I had mentioned. Um, yeah. And I would I would watch some of these custodians the last twenty or thirty minutes before we go out. They'd be watching these yeah. videos about people. There's a show called Jackass. And, and there are online versions of where people do this. You know, oh, I'm a big fat idiot. I'm going to see if I can drink water from a hose and turn it on full, you know, yeah. <laughs> and, and this entertains people. I mean, yeah. you know, but again, I think it, it, it would be it would be disingenuous to believe that it's 100 percent. I think there are the same percentage wise uh, intelligent mm. peoples that can appreciate art than that mm. there was 200 years ago. It's just more mm. difficult because the boobs out there, the dummies, the idiots, dwarf us. And I say this to my wife all the time. I say, they got the numbers, but we yeah. have the quality. And quality, yeah. uh, like it or not, I think mm. history shows that quality eventually does get through. And it may be yeah. difficult. And there are going to be hoops that I will have that Cervantes who wrote uh, mm. Don Quixote didn't have, but by the same token, I have advantages in other ways that uh, the Cervantes didn't have. I can put my books out on Amazon. Last year, my mm. wife and I combined made about $220 from Amazon, which means we probably mm. sold 50 or 60 books combined or something mm. like that, maybe 80. Mm. But slowly but surely, hopefully you get out there. Hopefully someone mm. might, like I said, do maybe this interview 
gets and is watched by someone who is a documentary maker and says, you know, I'd like to talk more to this Schneider guy myself and see what he has to say. Because I think that he's saying things that need to be said. Who knows? Mm. Yeah. But, yeah. but but my sitting here and not doing anything, my not writing, my just complaining that I work for a shitty company and I have a psychopath mm. that, that I work with that terrorizes the people in my company. Mm. Yeah. That's everyone has that. Everyone has that kind. Everyone has a bad relative who's a pain in the ass. Everyone has a boss who's an asshole. Everyone has yeah. a, an ex girlfriend or an ex boyfriend who's a nut job. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But uh, yeah, and this is related to my next topic. Before that, I'll just uh, share an anecdote, you know, what you said, the stupidity of the people. You know, when I landed in Canada, uh, just after a few days, uh, you must be knowing Jehovah's Witness, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so those guys came to my door, you know, uh, like I was living with this guy, his name was Harold Black, so I would stay with his, uh, in his house in the basement. So they came and they took me and I went, you know, I went along because they gave cakes and cookies and all those things. But uh, yeah, and it was a big congregation, like, like, uh, 1800 people and they just sat there and they started watching this uh, this uh, real housewives of New York or the yeah. you know, the show or something you know so I mean you're right uh, it, it does seem very pessimistic that the majority of human beings not just in America everywhere and that's why I said you know maybe I'm relating it to the internet but it could be other things also but I would I would think that 85 to 90 percent of the human population is just stupid dumb fucks so humanity is filled with dumb fucks I, I tend to agree. <laughs> Um, uh, but like I said, um, it, it's very easy to get flustered. My wife goes through emotional traumas that uh, I call sort of plathy and stuff. And I, I try not to worry about it. I try, unless someone like some coworker or some online harasser or stalker goes out of their way, I try not to take things personally. Um, mm. It, it's very easy to get wrapped up in yourself. Um, I try mm. to take the big picture. Like I said, I, I, I look at myself as a temporary vessel, uh, almost like mm. a prism. That uh, mm. as an artist, artists are prisms that, like I said, we uh, don't reflect, but we refract the universe. Mm. We make it easier for other people to understand things that come easily to us. If we're a great artist, mm. uh, people like mm. Melville or Kubrick, people like uh, Elizabeth Barrett Browning that I mentioned. Uh, have you heard of the painter Paul Gauguin? Yeah, yeah. Was, uh, yeah, so he was also like, I, 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 mean, I don't know, I, I like his paintings, but he's also like Van Gogh, right? Like not remembered, forgotten. And oh, no, no. Gauguin is a big name. Uh, he, 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 uh, uh, Gauguin, was he the guy who went to the South Seas? Yeah, Tanya yeah. Peach, right? Yeah, yeah, he was a friend of Van Gogh. So, I mean, he's not quite as well known as Van Gogh, but I mean, he, yeah. he's hardly obscure you know, in the painting world. Uh, no, I mean, I meant in his lifetime. So, uh, oh, I think he was a bit more well known than Van Gogh, but uh, um, I, 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 don't think, I don't think he was as well known as, say, Manet or Monet. Hmm. All right, okay. All right, so I'll go back. To my next question, now this is a question, uh, it's, it's a bit personal and uh, I ask this to people and it offends them, you know. Okay. Um, I, I, I put this in many uh, like religious uh, forums and I've got kicked out. So, uh, so I'll, I'll ask you this. Before that, I'll give you a quote that you said. The question was, in one of your interviews, what are the biggest forces preventing the dissemination of better quality poetry? And what you wrote is, unsurprisingly, it's the same forces that retard effective government, education, police enforcement, corporate behavior, etc. Basically, the moral behavior like greed, ego, stupidity, right? Mm -hmm. Now, my question to you is this. Uh, see, don't you think that uh, the most immoral people are the most successful uh, in every sphere of life, and I'm not talking about now, I'm talking about throughout human history. I'm talking about Ramses II or, or oh, sure. you know, Ashoka. Sure. I mean, uh, you know, uh, Attila the Hun, Genghis Khan were wildly successful. Uh, something like 20% of the people in Asia have the DNA of Genghis Khan because yeah. he, he, he fucked probably five, 6,000 women. I mean, he, yeah. he, he yes. was a kill and fuck kind of guy. He was life yeah. and death uh, living. Um, but having said that, I think Genghis Khan was a great man. I think Genghis Khan was the most important human being of the last thousand years because the, the Mongol Empire were not just a bunch of uh, retarded people going around killing people. They actually were one of the first 
demotic societies. They were they mm -hmm. you could practice your own religion. They weren't they weren't they weren't like Attila. They weren't like Alexander the Great. Uh, Genghis Khan. Yeah. If you remove Genghis Khan from history. The, for 6,000 years, the Mongols were just riding uh, in outer Mongolia. Uh, he, mm -hmm. This is a guy who literally, in just 15 to 20 years, changed mm -hmm. a bunch of horse riders, conquered all the horse riding cultures around him, conquered yeah. China, conquered 80% of Asia, the biggest yeah. land empire ever. They, uh, If you remove them, we probably yeah. have a world that's divided between China and Islam. Because if you yeah. remove, because the Mongols scared the fuck out of China, China withdrew into itself. Uh, the Mongols mm -hmm. scared the fuck out of the is uh, the the Muslims and 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 basically retarded their development. It wasn't the Christians mm -hmm. that 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 uh, retarded uh, Islam. It was the fucking Mongols until they were beaten somewhere in Palestine uh, in twelve twenty seven yeah. or thirteen hundreds or something. But yeah. um, and I forget why I brought uh, why what did what, what was your question? Oh, uh, yeah. about violence, yeah. 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 I mean, uh, yeah, it, it's true. Um, uh, if if you only care about yourself, I've often said this to myself. If, if all I cared about myself, I'm smart enough. I grew up. If you've ever seen the film Goodfellas, I grew up in that environment. Yeah. I'm a lot smarter yeah. than those characters there. If I wanted yeah. to be an evil son of a bitch, I could. I I could have been. I could. Th there's a. There was a gangster known as uh, uh, Lucky Luciano, and his side man was Mario Lansky, a Jewish guy. I'm not Jewish, but I'm smart enough that I would not have been in the in the way. I would have been running things behind the scenes. I know I if I wanted to manipulate people or whatnot, I, I could do that. I, I, I can see these kind of things. But mm. to what end? To what end? I mean, you can only have so much money. You can only fuck so many women. You can only you can only take in so much in life. Um I just I'm just fundamentally not like that. Uh in, in genetically, but I'm also smart enough to know that even if that was genetically in me, I would mm. see that that was a bad way to live because it ultimately doesn't put anything out there. This is why we have global warming. This is, you know, uh, we have uh, the U.S. and the West in general have fucked up the environment for 200 years since the Industrial Revolution. Now your country and China are actually pol producing more pollution. But who, who the hell are we now in the West to say that, well, you want to advance to our level, but you can't do that. Well, if we don't want that, we here mm -hmm. who have gotten rich, and not me personally, but the 1% here yeah. in the U.S. should say, listen, yeah. China, listen, India, we're going to share our wealth. We're going to share our technology. We occupy, you know, Carl Sagan and Sarma said, the pale blue dot. We are this yeah. insignificant little I world. Know. You know, yeah, I, yeah. you know, uh, it, it amazes me that, you know, I'm not saying, sure, uh, I there are people I don't like. If if you, if you showed me most women, I would probably say that that you know most women wouldn't sexually attract me. But it wouldn't be because they're black or they're Indian or they're Chinese. There are gorgeous women that way. You know, I'm not gay. That doesn't mean I can't recognize. You know, you seem like a good-looking guy. If I was gay and you were gay, maybe I'd, I and we lived next door, maybe I'd ask you out. But it's uh, this 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 is just. Uh, these are these petty little differences that ultimately don't mean anything because ultimately we're going to end up as little, if, if you're lucky, you're an artist, some, uh, some pieces of art. If you're not lucky, you're just going to be a computer entry, you know, uh, lived uh, 2015 to 2087, you know, Bill Jones. Uh, carpenter lived in Seattle, Washington. Moved to hmm. uh, Singapore. Uh, married uh, Suk Lee or whatever, and had three hmm. kids. That's all we're going to hmm. know about these people. There's yeah. data in a census bureau. Hmm. No, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, explain what I was trying to say. Look, uh, Dan. Now the thing is, when I started working, I had my first job. I had my second job. I had my third job. Now I'm an observer. I, I like to observe people. But what I understood is office jobs everywhere is just politics. And what I realized is the most immortal people, narcissists, sociopaths, psychopaths, they were the ones who would get promoted, all right, mm -hmm. in work. Now I have observed this in every culture, in every every place, right? That's one example. The second example I want to give you is now think about it. Religion, all religions, they say you have to be moral, you have to be a good boy, you have to be a good person, you have to be humble and all those things. But ultimately they are serving the people. The, the people that they're serving, the, the higher people of the order, the richest men or the, or the people in political power, 
they are immoral. Why don't the people realize this? Don't you think that democracy is a sham? Like democracy is a sham, right? Well, don't I, you think that? A... Uh, I mean, you know. I, I'm not a big fan of democracy in the sense that, like, when you're dealing with existential issues like global warming, you know, the mm -hmm. people have said the best system would be a benevolent dictator, but try finding yes, a dictator I, who's benevolent. You know, I, for example, if, if, if someone if someone gave me uh, the, the power to enact everything, I would be scared shitless because no matter how much uh, of a good person I think I am, there's going to be little things. I might, you know, at the, you know, in a in a fit of anger, I might whisk away someone, and 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 you know, just by flicking my hand, they're dead. They're wiped from history. That would that would weigh on me. I don't want to be an omnipotent being. Um, uh, and so I think that probably, you know, could could you have an inner circle of elite people? Well, we 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 saw how that does, that doesn't work with MFA writing programs. You get a bunch of incestuous. Bad, we, we've seen how that doesn't work in the arts. You, because what happens is the people who get the money to make art are not the best people. They're the people who are networking, the people who know how to work the system. Um, yeah. I don't know what the answer is. There may not be an answer. There probably is, but it's probably something that's going to have to sort itself out long after you and I are, uh, are off this world. Um, I, I don't have an answer for that. I do agree that most people are... Uh, if not full-blown psychopaths, certainly sociopathic, certainly there's a, a narcissistic set. The very idea to want to be a leader, to want to lead a yeah. country, to want to lead a yeah. religion is in itself an admission of that narcissism. I don't want to be a leader. You know, I, I want people to know that I'm a great writer, not because I need that. I need that. I want people to say, oh, this guy is a great writer. And, and, and the reason I can say that is that his stuff leads me to understand things better. I, I, Dan Schneider, reading him is a shortcut to my betterment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, that's uh, you know, that's a great thought, you know. But uh, uh, my point being that all the society and that and the society runs everything, right? I mean, you and me, they are cogs in the society, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, like you said, you mentioned Genghis Khan. Now, my hero, at least in my opinion, the greatest person who ever lived is Napoleon Bonaparte. Mm -hmm. And you could call him a benevolent dictator in some ways, right? Yeah. So, I mean, my point is that uh, all the politicians, like I said, I'm reading on, on American history. I'm reading on even Abraham Lincoln, although he wasn't a bad person, but he surrounded himself with cunning people, cunning diplomats and all those guys, you know. Yeah. So my point being that ultimately, if, if you are serving someone, you're paying taxes or whatever you're doing, you are, you know, you are serving the people who are... According to, I mean, what is evil anyway? Don't you ever think evil is just a word, right? Is it wrong to be selfish? Well, that that's well, let, let's let's put it this way: there's good selfishness and bad selfishness, and the idea of what evil is. You know, some I, when I was younger, I had the idea that evil might be like gravity. That maybe maybe that in the realm of the mind, if we if we mm -hmm. if we think of the mind as something maybe non-material, perhaps mm -hmm. evil is something that can warp a mind the way gravity can warp a star. I don't believe that anymore. I think it's an interesting idea, but I don't think there's any evidence for that. Um, I think evil is simply uh, things that have the worst consequences for either the most people or for individuals that that shouldn't be. Um, mm. I, I, we, you know, what what is evil? Uh, you know, the the problem of evil as it relates to believing in a god. Uh, is one mm. of these things that people have talked about for, for centuries. Mm. How can there be evil in a universe mm. if there is a God that is benevolent, whether it's the Christian God? Mm. I, I, I don't know if there's a similar thing in, in the oh, religions yeah. that you may have grown up in. But uh, th this is one of the things I, I don't believe in. I, I, I live in a materialistic universe. Everything I've ever read mm. and, and experienced shows me that the, the universe is materialistic. It would be interesting if there were aliens that came and were abducting us and doing sexual experiments. It would be interesting if there were, were lake monsters and big feet, if there were, were wild ghosts, you know, if you went into some old palace and there were the ghosts of, of emperors and shahs out there. But yeah. there's no evidence for it. There's nothing. And nowadays we live with the technology that, that even if you saw it on, on YouTube, it's easily faked. I don't know, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But, uh, you, you know, 
thing is like, again, I'm going back to politics one last time, you know, and American politics, and right now, what I believe, again, one of the downfalls of the internet technology is everybody's on Facebook, everybody wants to get offended, everybody wants to, and what I understand is, look at the Conservative Party, for example. Now, how could you, in any common sense, uh, relate religion or faith with politics? Don't you think it doesn't make sense to begin with? Human beings are emotional animals. Most people react emotionally. You know, I know some very intelligent people. Uh, if you've seen, if you've seen on uh, my website, I have some poems by a fellow named Don Moss. Don is one of yeah. the most intelligent people you'll ever meet. There's a video of me interviewing Don Moss on my eCosmoetical website. This is a very intelligent man. He's one of the, the three or four most intelligent people I've ever known. When I first met him a quarter century ago, he was a slightly left of center uh, mm. uh, atheist. As he's gotten older, he's gotten more conservative, more religious. I don't think he's any mm. dumber, but I think that mm. his desire to believe in a God or believe in afterlife, I can only ascribe mm. that to the you know uh, aging, the fear of death. I think uh, my observations is that people who believe in uh, emo uh, believe in uh, gods and whatnot. It's an emotional thing. I there's a, a woman that I was once involved with who's now a a new age Christian scam artist who thinks that she can talk with God and talk with the dead. And she mm. she she had some mental issues years ago, and I knew her. But now she's just a full blown pathological liar who's actually charging people money to to talk with her and whatnot. And I'm like. What is wrong with it? Well, she clearly has some emotional issues, just like some of the people who have spent years dissing me online or some of the people mm. that I worked with, some of the companies. I, I mentioned a company that got fired for me. This was a guy who was the number two person in the store I worked. He was do, mm. having people do illegal things. He wanted mm. to get rid of me because I didn't want to do illegal things. I lost my job at AT&T because the, the, the woman who was three or four levels above me wanted me to fill out legal forms stating that I had doing financial transactions I wasn't doing. I said, I'm not going to do it. I was the only person out of 15 people in my group that actually stood up and said unequivocally, no, mm -hmm. I ended up being forced out within six months. Most people mm -hmm. don't want to make a stand because we as a society do not stand up and protect whistleblowers. We do not stand up for the people who stand up for what is right. You can get mowed down. There's an old saying, the, the, nail, the nail that sticks most up is gonna get hammered down first. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so strange, so, uh, now one second. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, Okay. Don't you think that, and this is again my opinion, don't you think that everyone is agnostic? We don't know shit. We are floating on the spaceship, this spherical spaceship across the cosmos. Our, our, our lifespan, 80 or 90, whatever years, is too insignificant to understand or make sense of it. Don't you think that discussing about, uh, you know, being an atheist or being a theist, mm -hmm. it doesn't make sense? You're not going to get any conclusion. You're just going to waste time. Don't you think that all of us are agnostic? We don't know well, anything? Well, I think religiously, but I, for example, I don't think that you're a delusion that I'm creating. I don't think that I'm having this Skype conversation as part of a dream. I can recognize the difference between dream and reality. I think that Rishi Ja exists. So I'm not agnostic no, about I, your existence. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm talking about from the like societal perspective, how to sit down and discuss, like, like uh, Roger, uh, no, what was his name? The God Delusion. Uh, oh, uh, Howard Bloom. I think it was Howard Bloom. No, 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 no. no, no, no. Um, I, oh, I know. Uh, yeah. Richard, Richard, Richard Dawkins. Richard Dawkins. Dawkins. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, I, I put the book down halfway through because, again, he's saying, but then there's no proof, right? He could be. There can be a, a divine force, just as likely as there could be a alien civilization, right? Yeah, well, I mean, I, mean I, I think statistically there's probably some kind of aliens out there. Like I said, they're yeah. not going to be Klingons. They're more likely to be something like that yeah. black cloud that I mentioned. Um but yeah. that, uh, I could be wrong. Uh, it could be that every alien within at least the Milky Way is humans. It could be that, you know, there was a guy named Eric Von Donneken 50 years ago who had the idea of ancient astronauts. You know, he'd go to Indian yeah. temples. He'd go to Central American yeah. temples and say, oh, yeah. they went, you know, Vishnu was really a guy from a UFO riding. And uh, the, the, the ancient astronauts built the Egyptian pyramids, which are really half a million years old rather than 5,000 years old. You know, it's yeah. it's a... It's a load of nonsense, <clears throat> as far as we know. But you know, again, I'm not there. I, you know, I, I, I'm not. I've never been to the pyramid, so I can't say. But yeah. when I read books by people who are reputed to be uh, 
archaeologists, they all say it's nonsense and bunk them. I don't know if there are really black holes out there. I can't feel them. But I, I trust that the astronomy community of the world is not pulling the wool over our eyes. The same reason that I trust that that uh, global warming is man-made. Uh, everything that I've ever read suggests that. Uh, but I, I don't know it personally. Mm, yeah, yeah. Exactly. I mean, everybody has opinions, beliefs, and you cannot just question them, right? The ancient, ancient uh, aliens, everyone thinks that's psychobabble, but who knows? Well, there, right? are, there, are, there, are, there are people out there. There are people that, you know, have these odd beliefs. I think that it's getting better. I think that there are less religions. I think religion is less noxious than it was. I think Islam is in its last stages of dying off. I think Christianity in Europe is pretty much dead. Most people in, in Europe don't take the Pope seriously. Uh, in America, uh, we since we didn't don't have an official state religion, there are a lot of yahoos that, that feel a need oh, yeah. for it. But I think that's going to die off. Technology will kill it off. That is oh, good yeah. in some ways, but we don't want to get to a point where we live in a society of just hedonists that want to fuck sex bots, you know? Yeah, yeah. I know. <laughs> All right. Uh, so uh, I've started reading uh, Nietzsche, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, what I feel is that the analysis by others is far more fascinating than the actual, what he has written. But well, first yeah. and foremost, because I don't, uh, I, I started with the Das Park uh, Zarathustra, and yeah. it's sort of like the whole, uh, the way he's written, it's just going over my head. So I find that the people's analysis is far more fascinating. Well, I think uh, Nietzsche is one of those people that, uh, Nietzsche is one of those people that uh, uh, is sort of uh, a Rorschach mm. test. Uh, what you bring to Nietzsche uh, will affect what you get out of Nietzsche. For me, since yeah. I, I tend to try to go into something with a blank slate, uh, I think mm. he was a good writer. Uh, but I don't think, yeah. I don't think, well, something like uh, the idea of eternal recurrence, I, I think is silly. But let us, th there's the philosophical argument that if time is infinite, that everything will occur infinitely again and again. Meaning that, mm. that at an infinite point in the future, there'll be another Rishi and Dan talking just as we're talking in the exact same manner as we're talking. Mm. And then in another infinite, further on in, in infinity, there's going to be another Dan and another Rishi on and on and on and on and on and on. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> I think that's absurd. Yeah, I, mean, I think that's yeah, absurd that's because... <coughs> that's a bit more abstract, but uh, like uh, his will of power or his uh, Ubermensch. And yeah. I think you are like the embodiment <coughs> of the Ubermensch in your own way. <laughs> so do you think it's a fantastic, fantastic uh, concept, the Ubermensch? I think it's a good. I, I think it's a good concept, but I, I, I don't. I mean, yes, I, I think I'm smarter than an average individual. I know I am. I know that I've got more talent and I work harder. But I've, and I would be deluding myself to say that I'm an everyman. But by the same token, mm -hmm. I don't think that I have these superhuman powers. Just in the same way that LeBron James or. Neymar, the soccer player, are superhuman yeah. in what they do. What I do is a bit is is significantly more complex, and I think will last longer than LeBron or Neymar or whoever. Yeah. Uh, but but it can be done. I the idea the idea that uh, there's uh, an exceptionalism to me or. America has this idea that it's an exceptional country, meaning that it, the the previous rules don't apply to it. Well, I, I think it I think it does. Um, I think you know there are lots of countries that have great histories. China, for all of its problems, for all of its eons oh, yeah. of of being run by abusive assholes, is still a great yeah. culture. China has we can learn a lot from what way China is, and hopefully one day that those people will be free and and be a bit more democratic, but. Uh, I don't. I don't think that I'm exceptional in the sense that that uh, I'm doing anything that another person with exceptional talent couldn't do. It you know just the way Stanley Kubrick, a, a great artist, a great filmmaker, he was exceptional mm. in the sense that he was great. But I don't think mm. I, if you compare him to Orson Welles, they were both great filmmakers. Well. That yeah. there goes the idea that Kubrick was standing towering above each other because Wells is every bit the filmmaker Kubrick was, but in a different way. Same thing with someone like Cassavetes in his best film. Same thing yeah. with the people I've mentioned like Ozu and Satyajit Ray and uh, Akira Kurosawa and uh, Chelan from Turkey. These yeah. people are uh, uh, fantastic filmmakers, uh, but they're all different. So 
Uh, yes and no. It depends on how you define and look at it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, actually, I mean, I think we'll have to disagree on this because I believe, like, taking your example, that it is your will of power that is what makes you an Uber rich, and your will of power, will of power is your belief that your writing will be discovered 500 years from now. What more can you want? Don't well, you yeah, I mean. I, I would agree that, that that I take responsibility for my life. You know, I, yeah. I I take responsibility pro and con. There are things I wish I could change in my life. Everyone does. Well, whether it's uh, things that I saw as a kid, whether it's things that I, I've said or done uh, in the past. But you know, uh, the the will to power only goes so far because. Um, well, I think, for example, I think that my wife, like I said, who has these more artistic. Uh, uh, anxieties and neuroses could mm. do it, uh, could uh, overcome this. Uh, I think there are some people, especially when we're talking about things, uh, I don't know, like some mental illnesses like bipolarity or like um, uh, 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 other things. Uh, there, 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 yeah, there may be things that you need to have drugs or you need to have some kind of maybe in 20 years we'll have little bots that can go in and and rewrite someone's genetic program mm -hmm. that just the way we could make someone not a cripple or make someone not a, a dwarf we could make yeah. someone not a schizophrenic in in utero yeah yeah <laughs> And uh, yeah, uh, going on the topic of Nietzsche, so you wrote in one of your reviews, Hitler was a dedicated racist and or psycho psychotic mm -hmm. or a brilliant political opportunist. Now, there's nothing wrong with being an opportunist, right? You don't think it's, no. it's a bad quality? No, it, it depends on what you're taking. The if, if, if uh, you know, if you and I are, are pals and I take the opportunity mm -hmm. to try to uh, rape your girlfriend, well, that's an opportunity because I could overpower yeah. and you're not there. That's not a good opportunist. But if I take the opportunity yeah. to uh, speak to a thousand students at your university and, and tell them this, that, or the other thing to try to help them, that's a good opportunity. Yeah. yeah. Although, although I would say he was a horrible tactician and a strategist, right? Well, I think, I, I've said this before, and I think I said it in one of the shows I did about World War II, one of my interviews, is that the difference mm -hmm. between Stalin and Hitler is they were both mm. psychopaths, but Hitler was psychotic, meaning he was detached mm. from reality. Stalin, mm. to a certain degree, was, but he wasn't as psychotic as Hitler. And that, mm. I think, is the difference. You can talk all you want about the Soviet Union's advantage in, in man, manpower and in oil and, and uh, resources. But if Hitler had been a little more attached to reality and had waited mm. just a few months uh, or waited yeah. six months to invade Russia in, in the spring of 42 and well, 41, whenever it was mm. when the, the fiasco yeah. at Stalingrad, you know, the Germans could have won it. Uh, they could have at yeah. least controlled most of Asia. They never would have conquered yeah. the U.S., I don't believe. I think I think the Americas and the Western Hemisphere were not going to be conquered. And I think eventually, maybe by the 70s or 80s, Hitlerism would have died with him uh, mm. because of yeah. some other things. But... Again, this is this is this is the stuff of science fiction. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, uh, and this is one claim that I had to ask you. You say uh, Friedrich Nietzsche was both a collectivist and an individualist. Mm -hmm. How? I mean, I, I think Nietzsche is like the poster child for individualism. How, how do you think as a collectivist? Well, I I think he I think he uh, I I'd have to see what what. Uh, what the context it, of it was in, I think it was in the review of that uh, there was a person and he says the Nazis and Nietzsche, the comparison, and there was a TV show and he reviewed that TV show or a documentary, Na uh, Nazism and Nietzsche, something like that. Okay, yeah. Uh, I, I, again, I, I don't have that at my fingertips, so I, I, I'll have to pass on that simply because I don't know what context I was speaking in. Um, and uh, it's early in the morning and my mind isn't at its peak. All right, so. Yeah, okay, no worries. Yeah. All right, so, uh, okay, one more thing I wanna ask you. Now, Harold Bloom, uh, this is something you put in every interview of yours, and this inspires me so much. Now, Harold B. Bloom, the reactionary critic who champions the Western canon against multiculturalism. Like, uh, I didn't get the context. Is it in some book? Has it written, or does he say this? Yeah, he's got a book called The, the Western Canon. Oh, that's the name of the book? Yeah. Okay, oh. So it's a good read, I mean, I should... I mean, it, it it's... I, I mean, he's a he's a solid writer. No, nothing outstanding. Uh, his ideas uh, are pretty boilerplate. They're not anything that anyone else hasn't said before him. Um, but I mean, uh, 
you know, it's one of those things that, uh, yes, white males uh, have dominated uh, European mm -hmm. culture and, and Western culture, and Western culture has dominated uh, third world culture and, and yeah. the, even the yeah. communist world, which is now gone. But that doesn't yeah. that doesn't mean uh, that uh, white men are superior. That's ridiculous. You know, here in America, for example, uh, it's used to say that well, black people are stupid because they are the uh, they have the least amount of, of money and they uh, they they they're, they're, they're mm. poor. But if you look at every culture, whatever group is at the mm. bottom eco socioeconomically, they have the lowest mm. scores. The biggest indicator mm. of a low IQ score. Uh, is not mm. anything to do with genetics. It has to do with poverty. If if people who are as pale as me and to be whiter than me, you'd have to be an albino. But if mm. if I if I was the representative of my race and my people yeah. were living in Madagascar and we were mm. at the bottom of the ladder and and mm. for ten mm. generations all people with pale skin were said that they were stupid and they were scumbags and they were they were mm. sleazy and they reproduced like fleas and and whatnot. Mm. Well, guess what? Mm. Uh, people, people are like that woman I mentioned who didn't want to pay her, who wanted to pay a cable bill and not her electrical bill. They say, "Fuck it, I'm about me. I need something in my life. Everyone's against me. I just want me, me, me." And and mm. I have I have known that the people who are the most self centered and greedy are those people who are the poorest and those people who are the richest. The poorest do it because they have absolutely no other thing good in their life mm. but the rich yeah. people do it because they have an insecurity you know white mm. men in this country and i'm i don't like political correctness but it's absolutely mm. true that white males in the western world especially the u.s and uk and france and, and whatnot they have a fear because because they know they know that they did nothing to gain their position of superiority by via mm. intellect by being better in any sense, uh, they they are the inheritors of. The, there's an old saying when George Bush, the first, or this, uh, George W. Bush ran. A, a woman said he was born on third base in American mm. baseball, and he thinks he hit a home run. If you're yeah. given, if if you have to run a hundred meter dash, and and you have to run the hundred meters, and I just have to take mm. two steps, I don't care mm. if you're Usain Bolt. I'm gonna beat mm. you to the finish line. Mm. That doesn't mean yeah, I'm faster. I Okay. No, but I mean, I actually side with uh, Mr. Bloom, you know, because uh, I, I would say that I'm not exactly the white man per se, but I do believe that Western culture is in many ways much, much superior. And maybe not now, of course not now, but at least in, in the Renaissance or the Industrial Revolution. I mean, I do believe that individualism is the, is the best uh, way to live. I mean, I live in a collective society and it's a horrible, horrible society. You know? Well, Western so, culture has, I, 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 I agree, Western culture has good things. The thing is you have to take the positives from each culture. Yeah, Western, exactly. cu Western culture, though, is also responsible for the Middle Passage. It's also responsible for more genocides than the communists. Western culture is responsible for racism, the wiping out of Native Americans. It's responsible for the, the Belgian Congo massacre. It's responsible for apartheid. It's responsible for uh, countless wars, fought proxy wars, fought in Asia. It's responsible for for uh, discrimination against homosexuals, against women. Uh, uh, it's responsible for this me first attitude that has gotten us global capitalism and, and brought us corporations. And I, if you ask me, the greatest existential threat to human life right now is corporatism. Corporations are behind global warming. Corporati corporations are behind uh, the the oil, uh, they, they run the oil companies which fund Islamic terrorism. Corporations yeah. are behind so many of the evil deeds here. To me, they are a corporatism is almost a synonym for organized crime, and far worse than what you'd see in The Godfather about Italian mafia or whatnot. Give me the old-fashioned mafia. We know they're bad guys, but but Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos are every bit as bad. They might not be ordering hits and killing people, but their policies kill people. Their, the policy in Bhopal 30 years ago when people died, you may, might not have even been born then. You know, there was uh, Union Carbide, what was it, two or 3,000 people died because some corporation didn't give a fuck about the, the chemicals they were using. That is exactly. capitalism, and that is, that is unfortunately the end game of, of where Western society goes to, unfortunately. But then maybe 
you guys just got there first. That's that's the nature of yes, nature. Yes, absolutely. And if you re- if you read a book by Jared Diamond uh, about oh, yeah, he, he, blood guns and yeah yeah he guns. talks about yeah. that that uh, geography is history. And I think even though he's been criticized and ridiculed a lot, I think he's on to something. I don't think it, it's the total end all explanation. But you know, mm-hmm. if if for example, dark skinned people had emigrated to Europe and they had stayed dark skinned, they they probably wouldn't because of the latitude or whatnot. Mm-hmm. But and, and 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 Africans had turned out to look like me. Well, I think I think I think Africans would have you know would have been just as cruel, just as whatnot mm-hmm. exactly. as, as us. Uh, it, it's human yeah, because- nature that we we yeah. all have the same prejudices. We all have the same impulses right. toward, towards greed yeah. and solipsism and violence and whatnot. There was always yeah. that monkey who wants to be the only monkey that knows where the best bananas are. Yeah. Yeah. But then, I mean, again, you know, like the previous question I asked you about morality and politics and, you know, how religion says that you have to obey and the people obey and the people on the top. And that's when you mentioned corporations mm-hmm. or, or anybody who goes up, you know, so yeah. it's nature, isn't it? I'm not saying it's good or bad. It's nature to form alliances. It's nature to form, hey, you're rich, I'm rich, let's form an alliance. And that's what happens. That's the, that's that's what will happen in any society. Well, yes, any- but, but just because something's natural doesn't mean you should fight against it. When I grew, I told you I grew up in a society that was good fellows. Like my natural impulse when someone disagrees with me would be to punch him in the face. That's my mm-hmm. natural instinct. I, I mentioned how uh, just yesterday I had to report this coworker who's been harassing people at the job. 30 years ago, this person, she's female, so I wouldn't have hit her because she's a woman, but I would have dealt with her in a much different way than I have to now. And, and, and I, don't, I, I, don't like, I, I don't like confrontation. I don't like, you, if you want to believe in gods and, and it, believing in God makes you fun, I don't care. Just don't force it on me. But if you force mm-hmm. it on me, then you're going to get a negative reaction. But yeah, so I mean, again, like, you know, the way, I, because I've been uh, like, you know, it may call it an existentialist crisis or, or having a dilemma. I mean, you're coming of age, you know, because when you are in your teens and stuff, you don't think about these things. But now, you know, when I look at the world, and maybe this is evolution, you know, maybe evolution dictates that the the immoral person, the greedy, the corrupt, the uh, the selfish, selfless man will will you know rule the world. Maybe you know that's what civilizations are all about. Maybe well, this, this is my opinion. And this is why we have to work against it. Now, the problem is a lot of you, what, you know, if there was a film by William Cameron Menzies called Things to Come based upon an H.G. Wells story, it was made in the late Mm. 30s, right before World War II, right before the bombing Mm. of London. And in it, Mm. after after an apocalypse, a group of Mm. scientists goes around and they try to fix the world. And of course, these scientists are, are white men who fly around in sort of UFOs and try to fix the world and whatnot. Now, it, you know, things like Doctors Without Borders. Um, now, that's a good thing. Uh, but by the same token, you you cannot go around saying, well, Western culture produced uh, democracy. Well, Western culture produced this without acknowledging the negatives that it produced and saying, look, we have to find some new ways. Let's take the best of Western culture. Let's take the best of Eastern philosophies, Buddhism. Let's take the best. Of, and, and Buddhism itself has a bloody history. Uh, they, the, the first peoples in the Himalayans were not Buddhists. The Buddhists wiped them out. And so, but you have to acknowledge this. You have to acknowledge yeah. that the United States ha- is built on murder. It's built on, on mm-hmm. death and, and, and racism and, and, and bigotry. But the U.S. also has done good things. Uh, every mm-hmm. country has. Uh, every culture has. There's good and bad. Some, like yeah. the Nazis, the, the good is maybe only 1, 2, 3, 4 percent, and it's 96 percent mm-hmm. bad. Some, mm-hmm. there might only be 5 or 10 percent bad. But you have to mm-hmm. acknowledge the good and the bad and, and say, well, this hasn't worked. For example, here in the U.S., I could die. If I don't have money, I could die from some disease. In Europe, you mm-hmm. can't. No one in Europe dies because of lack of medical care. But here in the U.S., yeah. people care more about money. That's wrong. That has to change because mm-hmm. that because I or some poor person, some homeless person, deserves to have as best a life as they can. They might not do anything. Mm-hmm. They probably won't do it. The guy who's a homeless bum who has you know cancer of the pancreas, even if he gets that removed, will probably spend the next ten or fifteen years till he dies doing nothing yeah. but he should at least yeah. have that opportunity and we should at least say that that we value this individual enough to give him a shot he'll probably yeah. blow it that's the way most yeah. people are they will blow the opportunities they have but give him yeah. a fair shot 
Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I mean, okay, not on this topic, yeah. But uh, again, you know what I believe is, uh, you must have seen my uh, Skype main picture, it's Clint Eastwood, right? I'm a huge yeah. fan of Clint Eastwood, you may disagree. But uh, the reason I like him so much is because, you know, if I were an American, I would be a libertarian. I just want to be my own responsibility. You know, I don't want anybody to take my responsibility. I don't well, want that's, to this, the Libertarian Party in the U.S., though, is not really libertarian. Libertarians in the U.S., the Libertarian Party, they are shills for corporations. You cannot talk about individual responsibility when you're supporting corporations. So the Libertarians, just like in, in the U.S., one of the things that in U.S. politics, at least, is most conservatives are not conservative. It is not conservative, for example, for someone to say, oh, a woman can't have an abortion. It's conservative to say the government has no say in that. Liberals are not liberal because no liberal would support political correctness. And in the same way, most libertarians here in the U.S. are not libertarians because they support corporations. A corporation is a legal fiction. If you're a libertarian, you're a civil libertarian for human beings. And so what we have here in the U.S. at least, I don't know if it's that way in your country, but in the U.S. we have political ideologies that lie about themselves even in how they, they, they define themselves. <laughs> it's so uh, yeah, I mean the, the the meaning keeps changing, right? What was uh, liberal in the sixties or seventies is is probably I don't know what it is today, right? Well, like, that, that's uh, why here here in the U.S. there's a difference now. People are trying to make a distinction between being a progressive and yeah. being a liberal. Neoliberalism here in the U.S. Uh, is really sort of like neoconservatism. These are people like Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton who basically mm. uh, uh, take money from corporations. They they, they, mm. they mouth about, oh, we're for poor people, we're for equal rights and whatnot. Yet here in the U.S., black men get shot by cops mm. routinely. Every, every other week, there's a, a video of a black person getting shot by a cop that no white person would. I can't live, in, I don't want to live in a society like that. Just because that person has brown skin doesn't mean I don't feel empathy for them. If the person is walking on, there, there, were, there were teenage boys, young black boys here in America that are killed by white cops and sometimes even by black cops because these people have been so deluded into their thinking. And it's, it's a terrible thing. And it's something that, uh, you know, I don't have the time right now to go into, but. All right, I'll ask you one last question. Now, okay. this is uh last bit, all right? So this is psychoanalysis, okay? Now, don't you think that one of the tragedies of life is that how vulnerable the human child is when he's born, when he or she? And you know, I have a belief, now I could be wrong and you might get angry, but I believe that most women are shitty parents, are like shitty mothers. They don't even know how to be a mother. Don't you think so? Well, but I, I'd say equally, most men don't know how to be fathers. Mo I mean, most, no, pe I mean most people don't know how to... Most, most people are, again, solipsistic. They are about themselves. I am the monkey. I found the best banana grove. Mm. I'm not going to share it. Most people are, are like that. Uh, most, yeah, most people are bad at most things. Most, you know, I, if I tried 10,000 different human endeavors, I would fail at 9,920 of them. Maybe 80 of them I, I'd succeed at. Maybe 70 of them I would be okay to good at. Maybe ten of them I'd be very, five of them I'd be very good at, and the last five I'm great at. And mm -hmm. I, you have to know how to do that. Uh, my wife, for example, I love her to death. She would have been a bad mother. She was, she was smart enough to know she'd be a bad mother. I'd be a great father, but she knew that she wouldn't be a good mother because she's too self-centered about herself. And I love my wife to death, but that's the truth, and she admits it at least. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, because I mean, I'm I'm doing a lot of reading on psychoanalysis, you know, because I found my diagnosis through psychoanalysis. No other thing could diagnose me. So, uh, but my point was more to do with biology. You know, what the more I'm reading, the more I'm realizing is that the the baby when it's formed inside the womb and when it comes out, you know, there there, there are such delicate delicate aspects to it that uh, anything that goes wrong, even like three days, if the mother is away from the child, it could define that child. Mm. You understand that? Well, so it's yeah. like there's a big biological component to this, plasma or something, you know? And that's the reason all these personality disorders, schizoids, schizophrenia, uh, avoidant, mm -hmm. and, and, and they're in, like, I'm seeing them at such a high rate everywhere around the world. I can, I can literally see people this, who are walking for- This, is, this is, this is, this is the end game of evolution though, because do you know the term neoteny, N-E-O-T-E-N-Y, neoteny, what that means? That means that that as, as human beings have progressed, 
we get more infantile when we're born. If you look at a rat, a baby, a rat, or you look at a crocodile, even go to reptiles mm -hmm. and amphibians, when those are born, they're basically just miniature, smaller versions of the adults. They are fully formed mm -hmm. in that and grow. Oh, a yeah. human yeah. being, a human being isn't. We, we gain, yeah. the, the, the reason human beings don't have hair when they're born, the reason we have bigger eyes is so that our brains can grow some more once we get through the birth canal. This is known as neoteny. And, and this means that human beings and complex animals uh, mm. are more vulnerable when they're young. That's why human beings need to be with their parents for at least 12 to 15 years minimum. This is why yeah. it's the same with elephants. Uh, but a crocodile or, or say a, a turtle can lay the eggs and go off and the little turtles, yeah. you know, make it to the sea and they're on their own. And out of the thousand little turtles that get into the sea, only two or three survive to produce again, reproduce. Yeah, yeah. But like I said, there's a big biological component, right? I'm not talking about spiritual or, or you know, just like... A biological yeah. aspect to all the mental disorders or personality disorders. Mo most so? like, most likely, I think there are. You know, the, the, I think I think most of life is nature and nurture. When people talk about why, uh, why mm. is there transgenderism? Why is there homosexuality? Why is there this? Why is there that? Uh, I don't mm. think it's a hundred percent biological. I, I I don't think it's a hundred percent nature. I think if you were to, if if you could find mm. some metaphysical certainty into why something mm. is. And I don't know if you could do that. But if you were to, mm. to look at every homosexual, for example, in the world, male mm. and female, and if you could find the reason that they are, my guess is there'd be dozens of reasons and there'd be mixtures of dozens of reasons. I, mm. uh, I, I, yes, there are there are obviously some effeminate men who are, are clearly gay and there are butch masculine women that yeah. You you know that they're lesbians, yeah, but exactly, the yeah. vast majority of them you're not going to be able to tell. Certainly not as a child. Cert certainly yeah. this stuff with uh, I'm I'm this gender. You know, here in the U.S., some people think there's seventy something plus genders, and it's like, uh, well, mm -hmm. you know, we're talking to the point of absurdity here. But it all comes yeah. down to people wanting to be. Uh, it's about me. I'm special. There's a difference, mm -hmm. for example, here that people don't recognize. Is we are all genetically individual. But being individuated mm. does not mean being mm. special. Uh, I mentioned mm. eternal recurrence and the and you and I having this conversation many times over, but it would not be you mm. and me because, mm. because in the infinite amount of time that it would take mm. for everything to play out that you and I could have a conversation like this again, the very mm. fabric of the universe would break down, meaning that mm. there would have to be new particles that come into existence. And those particles would not exist now when you and I are doing this interview. In other words, even if something like eternal recurrence occurs, it's going to be a different Dan and a different Rishi. And in, and and you are totally, into it. there will never be another Rishi Ja just like you, even if the universe is timeless. But people want to feel special. and. And, and it, it, you know, because, because they are, a lot of modern society dehumanizes us. It's dehumanized by the internet. It's dehumanized by people who are bigots or racists. It's dehumanized by capitalism at, at its worst. It's dehumanized by communism at its worst, collectivism at its worst, the things that you've mentioned. Mm -hmm. There are many systems that they don't want to, to afford people because people have the zero something. If, for example, you become a great filmmaker, I'd be happy. I'd say, "Oh, I talked with that guy. Uh, may maybe he, uh, maybe he becomes. You know, I, I write a book about a guy like him or whatnot." But a lot of people think that if you succeed, you can only mm. succeed if I fail, and people resent mm. that. People resent mm. that, and there's this little demon inside the minds of people that if Dan Schneider says he's a great artist, he must be an egotist. They haven't even read yeah. my shit, and they and they'll mm. write write his poetry sucks and. Okay, why does his poetry suck? They can't say it because they don't even know what good poetry is. And they'll point yeah. to bad writers and bad artists and whatnot. And it's all because they want to feel special. Yet these are the same people who are just anonymous trolls because they're not even willing to put their name or their face on things. I am only exactly. Dan Schneider. Online, you can. I'm accountable for everything I've ever written and ever said. I may not remember, like I didn't remember the thing you said about Nietzsche. I'd have to, you'd have to send me the quote or for where it's from, mm -hmm. or tell me yeah. which article I'd look at it. But uh, you know, I, but I'm not going to say anything stupid. I'm not going to say that black people are, uh, are, are animals. I'm not going to say that Jews need to be burned in, in the Holocaust. I'm not going to say that gay people should be killed. I don't say mm -hmm. these kinds of things. Um, but people want to. 
want to always be able to put someone down because they're missing something. Whether it's a coworker that wants to abuse people because they feel badly, whether it's whether it's a religious leader that wants to say that my religion is better, or whether yeah. it's a Donald Trump that wants to say that, uh, you know, I, I need more money and we need to do this and keep the Mexicans out of America. Well, Mexico is, uh, Mexicans are fine enough people. There are bad Mexicans and good Mexicans, just like there are yeah. good Americans and bad Americans. But this, this is really simple. Most of what is wrong and most of what is bad in human existence is caused by other people. As the old saying goes, <laughs> hell is other people. Hell is other people. So that guy saw Sartre is great, right? Yeah, I no think so. To... Yeah. yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, and on that note, I wanted to ask you, I just saw you over here. See, there was an interview with you from, uh, for an analysis of you, onlygoodmovies.com. And the comments over there, they rip you up. They call you a homophobe. They call you trash. Oh. You be. So how do you develop a thick skin or whatever? Like you don't give a shit. Like it's oh. easy to say, right? I, I, I do don't. Just... Just, uh, I, I, Jessica is often looking up and finding these uh, Yahoo threads where someone's ripping on me. Or there yeah. was when Roger Ebert did a thing. There was a Empire Online is another film thing where these people are. These people don't even read. You know, if, yeah. if you're going, if you're going to be a slack jawed caveman, what, what do I care what you think? You know, if, 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 if you who in two plus hours have shown that you have a brain, if you, if you tell me, well, Dan, I found this comment that you made about so-and-so actor to be uh, misogynistic or, and I'd say, well, show me the comment. And I, I try to explain what it was. And if somehow I made a misogynistic comment, which I don't think I ever have, at least not in print, uh, yeah. you know, I'd apologize for it. But we, we live in this gotcha kind of culture. And, and most of the time, it, it, it's just, again, these online trolls, these people who, if you look at the comments people make, you know, oh, they joined this website three months ago. They've had 15,723 comments. Don't they have mm -hmm. lives? <laughs> I actually yeah. do positive things. I'm not, I'm not, yeah. I mean, these people probably are, are so screwed up that, you know, just masturbate. Why are you typing? <laughs> At least masturbation, you know, you'll have a little, you give yourself a little pleasure. I can't imagine yeah. going on trolling people and finding pleasure from that. But then maybe that's my flaw. <laughs> I know. Uh, so, all right, Dan, I'm done now.